Well, hello everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 207. So glad you could join me. Today's guest, Jane Clark, is here from Ireland. She'll be with us in just a little bit. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. Uh, we just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too, so please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Ring the bell for notifications. Uh, whatever you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. And do it right now because that's when we need the help. Now, um, we have our Poets Respond Poet to start out like we usually do. And let's go right over to um, Bridget Kreiner and uh, talk about Sunday's poem. Hi, Bridget. How are you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. It's so great to have you on. Um, can you tell us about what inspired this poem? It was such a strange story, I have to admit. When you sent it in, I had to read it like three times to even make sense of what they were even saying <laughs> in this court case that you were talking about. So could you explain it to everybody for uh, people trying to understand it? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I, um, once upon a time, worked as an abortion clinic advocate and have done that work for a long time. So I keep track of these cases. Um, and this most recent one that came out regarding the abortion pill mifeprestone um, the judge had a really unusual argument in which he was essentially saying that um, doctors, when um, pregnant people choose to have an abortion, that doctors are deprived of their right to view the fetus. Um, they use the word unborn baby, but um, that that was the doctor's right to be able to see those ultrasound pictures and that um, they suffered aesthetic injury when um, their patients um, chose to have abortions and used some very unusual case law, like um, basically equivalent, making an equivalency between doctors and like bird watchers that may have um, been, you know, through some other types of pesticides or government policy may have been, you know, there was a reduction in the bird population that they were interested in viewing and um, that the doctors were parallel to that, you know, like the bird watcher was deprived of its opportunity to see the bird they were interested in. And so that um, doctors' relationships to fetuses was similar to that. Yeah. Is that clarifying? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just such a strange... I mean, it's hard to really even like yeah, say. Yeah, it feels like a kind of, um, really yeah, like an <laughs> activist type, you know, just a ruling, twisting some other you know, explanation around to, to make, you know, to fit the case law that you want instead of, um, the, the, you know, actually following the law. So the opposite of what a judge is supposed to do, I guess. Um, and so how did you, how did you know that this would be a, a poem? Like how did a poem come out of this strange story? Well, um, you know, I was just thinking about like the sense of entitlement, um, that, you know, one might have that, that's operating in this premise, but that also, um, you know, that, that there is also an entitlement that maybe in adventure tourism or whatever, that we feel entitled to be able to participate and like see animals in these contexts as well. And so that um, there seems to be an analogy to me in my mind between um, that sense of entitlement. Like I'm here to hunt and I deserve to be able to um, get what I came for, and that with the doctors, there was a that are bringing this to like a similar kind of entitlement that like they are, you know, and that their suffering of disappointment or like what a bummer it is that they can't see the ultrasound photo that brings them so much joy is somehow equivalent to the life of a pregnant person. It feels really <laughs> weird to me in a lot of ways. Yeah, so I think that's what it came out of. Yeah, it's really bizarre that um, um, just that, 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 I don't know, that you could think of, um, of, of having a right to that as a doctor, like as if that's not your job or something, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, like, like, I don't know, like arguing like I have the right to like read a good poem it would even be strange enough. I don't know. It's such a strange thing. Anyway, let's hear the poem and uh, let's go ahead and read it. We'll put it up on screen for everyone at home. Sounds good. Um, on aesthetic injury, the epigraph reads, 
it does not follow that acorns are oak trees or that we had better say they are. Judith Jarvis Thompson. Every wildlife adventurer understands the lure of spotting a rare creature in its natural habitat. Like when you're in an airboat skimming over the swamp and you yearn to feed marshmallows to gators, watch their jaws open and snap as they swim right up to the boat, glimpse their armored bodies sunning on logs among blooming swamp irises. Or when you're hang gliding over the Grand Canyon suspended by nothing more than a thin, flexible wing. You count on looking down on bighorn sheep and bison roaming as you circle overhead, or in an open air four by four, driving through the heart of a game reserve, you reckon you'll be among lions, elephants, rhinos, leopards. Or when you snorkel out in the night, it is expressly to swim with giant wild manta rays to come within inches of their grand wingspan. But if it just isn't in the cards for you to behold any of them, despite all your concrete hopes and calculations, what a bitter pill that would be. Yeah, great, great ending there. And and just, it's wonderful to be able to make poetry out of news, which is what we try to do every week with Poetry Spawn. And you did a great job of that. Thanks so much for sharing that, Bridget. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. You too. I think that was Bridget Kiner with On Aesthetic Injury. Uh, that was Sunday's poem of the day at rattle.com. Now we're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest, Jane Clark. So sit tight, and I will be right back with more poetry. <laughs> And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Like I said, today's guest is Jane Clark, one of my favorite poets from the Irish Poets issue that we just did last spring. Um, Jane Clark is the author of three poetry collections and an illustrated poetry booklet. Her three collections were published by Blood Axe Books, The River in 2015, When the Tree Falls in 2019, and the most recent, which we'll focus on today, A Change in the Air this year, which was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for Best Collection and is also longlisted for the Laurel Prize. In 2016, The River was the first poetry collection ever shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature Andaje Award, given for a distinguished work of fiction or nonfiction evoking the spirit of place. Originally from a farm in Rose Common, Jane now lives in Glenmere County, Wicklow. Uh, find more info at her website, janeclarkpoetry.ie. And here she is, Jane Clark. Hi, Jane. How are you doing? 
Hi, Tim. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure having you. I, I really loved your work. Um, it was one of the best. I think people maybe don't get to see, of course, the submissions that I see, but I loved all four poems that you sent. It was an argument over which one we'd take. Um, and just beautiful, lush language, really condensed is a, a sort of trademark of your work, um, you know, with, um, you know, rural pastoral themes, which are beautiful. It was just a, a wonderful, you know, poetry to read it. It sort of twists and hits hard um, in a tight little space. I just loved it. <laughs> Thanks very much. That's lovely. Um, do you want to start out by reading that poem? I think that's the first one you wanted to do, right? Um, after, which we published in Rattle. Yeah, and it's it's actually the first poem in the new collection as well. After. Now that her heart is bent over, like Larkspur after a storm, she stays in bed past milking time, pulling the quilt tight around her shoulders until her collie barks her down the stairs to lift the back door latch. She kneels to light the kippings piled on last night's embers. Her bones creak like the bolt on the door of the barn. A cup of oats, two cups of water, a pinch of salt, porridge, tea and tablets, a meal for a queen. Every day without him is too long. She's waiting with the tired cows at the gate. Yeah, I mean, that's an example of the beautiful poetry uh, that you write, Jane. And, and how, does a, how does a poem like that come to be? I was looking at one of the materials you sent, um, a description of a, a, later, a later poem that we're going to read, the Pit Ponies um, poem. But, um, but, but it, there seems like a lot of work goes into these poems. Like they, they really condense down over a long period of time, it seems to me. So, so what is your writing process like to get to this, this level of image and detail and concision? Yeah, well, this this one did take a long time, and it's it's interesting because it was nearly ready for the previous collection, mm. and the previous collection was very much elegiac for my father, and so I nearly put this in, but actually it wasn't quite ready, and I'm glad I didn't because it just felt quite right to open the next, you know, the new collection, which in a way is it's an after collection, you know, after after my father in so many ways for my mother, but also for myself. But so the, so the making of it, like one of the, you know, the one her bones creak like the bolt on the door of the barn that was in in a poem years ago that didn't come to fruition, which was about my mother when when she was about 70. So like that was, you know, um, 18 years ago you know, that I was trying to write a, that poem, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes, you know, a poem doesn't work. You no, know it isn't quite right. And one of the things that's great about writing over a time that now I see, that's OK, put it aside. You'd never know when you'll be able to get it going again. Um, and so this poem, you, you know, sometimes it feels like a poem has to find its time. It's not ready yet. You know, you can be trying to make it ready, but you have to wait until it's ready. And so, you know, then all it's sort of until all every little element comes together. So I suppose, you know, the beginning of the poem came later than the middle, if you like, and then the ending um came you know at the at the very end and 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 again that poem isn't of today that's not how my mother is now you know it's not that every day without him is too long now because you know there's time has passed mm -hmm. but so that was written that was finished very soon after my father died so I think that explains the level of emotion in it you know and maybe it was me sensing my mother's emotion, but me also feeling my own emotion. And isn't that what we do in poems? Mm. You know, we because of our own emotion, we can feel for other people, uh, you know. And and again, the poem helped. I suppose I do think there's something about how can you feel very strongly and be a bit more distant as well? Mm. I think that's the maybe the difficult skill in poetry, you know, to 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 feel and step back from those feelings to make it into something that you can that me, that's meaningful for other people. 
Yeah, that's really well put. I've always said that uh, the poems are little empathy machines, and that yeah. they're you know they're really ways to to live, to to put your breath inside the breath of someone else, and so you can walk literally in their shoes and and feel the breath that they feel, and that's yeah. why poetry works so profoundly. And that's a great explanation of uh, of why. Um, you you started poetry later in life than most. It was uh, forty four years old you were oh, when. Yeah. Uh, you wrote yeah. your first poem um, after about 10 years, I guess, of, of reading poetry and, and not writing. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that, about what it was like to come into poetry a little later than most? Because most people I talk to start when they're usually in their teens, you know, they start writing a lot of poetry and then craft yeah. it over the years and don't jump into it later. Yeah, no, I hadn't written at all at all. And I hadn't done any kind of creative writing. But obviously, I was really interested because, you know, I studied English in college and I was always reading, but I was mostly reading novels and short stories, I, even though poetry was part of my life. But I, I, it was really when I was training as a psychotherapist in my 30s and it was psychoanalytic psychotherapy. So it's very, you know, it's very deep kind of work that you're doing, you know, to be a therapist, you have to do that kind of deep work yourself. And I suppose it put me in touch with a lot of sadness, a lot of loss. And I found that poetry really helped me at that time. And I, you know, so, you know, for example, um, you know, Elizabeth Bishop, um, the art, you know, one art, like I just read that for the first time when I was maybe 32, 33. And it just seemed to it really resonated with me, her way of distancing her feelings. And I knew that from myself, but I knew it from people I was working with as a therapist, that that's what we do. We try and say it doesn't matter. And all the time we're revealing how much it matters. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's when you find that kind of a truth, that nugget of truth in poetry and the way that a poem can say in so few words what is almost impossible to explain in any other way. So, yeah, so that's how I started reading it differently in my 30s. Mm -hmm. I also think that because I was training as a psychoanalyst, I think it's what freed up my creativity. I think they're connected, definitely. And so then, you know, my early 40s, you know, there was a, it, it was saying, you know, the thing I'd always wanted to do, which was to write, suddenly I let myself try it. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it, isn't it interesting how in life we can it can take a long time to let us let ourselves do what we really want to do. I think I've wanted to do it since I was three or four. You know, um, my father used to call me Shevana the scribe. You know, it's out of the Bible <laughs> because I was always writing, you know, and that was his nickname for me. But. I wasn't aware of that that desire really until you know it was in my forties. I thought, now I'll give it a go, and that was really it. Then yeah. it just got started, you know. Yeah, that is funny for me too. My my dad would always say, "Oh, the poet," <laughs> and I was like, yeah. "I'm not a poet, Dad. I'm gonna yeah. be, I'm going into science." And um, you know, he knew yeah. better than me. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's really interesting how the people around us do mm -hmm. know. You know, people who know us well, they sense things about us, don't they? Maybe before we can sense it. You know? <laughs> they, they definitely yeah. do. Yeah. Well, yeah. I want to talk more about uh, poetry and psycho psychoanalysts, um, but let's uh, let's read another poem first. Yes. So um, I thought I'd read another poem. This is another poem inspired by my mother. She and my father and my grandmother have definitely been muses in my work. Um, so, and this one is, it's, it's from this time in my mother's life when her, you know, her short term memory is fading and, but she is remembering so much about her, her childhood and out of that tells the kind of most amazing stories. Um, so all the horses she's ever loved gather around my mother's bed, best from Abergavenny would leap any fence for the company of cows. Fred would let himself out of the stable and lift his head collar off the peg. Rory stomped into the kitchen one evening and devoured a loaf of oven warmed bread. Only yesterday, she and her sisters were in the trap on the way to school with the pony that yearned to race the train. 
He galloped the long bog road from Ballymo, and not even her father holding the reins could slow him. Now Sunday morning, she's with her brother in the haggard pitching hay from a rick. Before the church bells ring in the village, the cattle must be fed. They build the load, tie it with ropes and heel up the shafts to back in the Clydesdale by the bridle. At first, she frets about steering Jack as he pulls the cart, swaying up the narrow lane and through the gateway. But horses have more gumption than any of us, she says. She loosens the reins, gives him his head. Yeah, and that was um, All the Horses She Ever Loved, once again, from um, A Change in the Air, Jane Clark's newest book, uh, another beautiful poem. Um, so so how much of of poetry is psychoanalysis? I mean, that's one of the things that I always wonder. You know, I talk to some people, and they don't like to think of poetry as therapy, but poetry is so clearly therapeutic. Um, you know, it's taking these, these sort of um, memories and experiences that we haven't really digested, haven't made sense of, um, and haven't articulated, and then turning it into something concrete and tangible that we can hold and understand and then share to others and help them experience it too. So to me, I mean, it feels like, like self-therapy, that what, the actual process of writing. Um, do, do you feel that way, or do you think that there's, there's some distance and we shouldn't think of poetry like that? Well, I, I, I suppose I just think that there's lots of ways in which they're similar. Um, so, so I don't, I don't see poetry as taking the place of therapy, or therapy as taking the place of poetry. But I do think that they're that they're very connected and that they can help each other. Mm-hmm. That's how I see it more. Um, but so one of the things, one of the ways I think there is a similarity. You, know, in my training, one of the things was to be able to think and to feel. You know, some people are stronger on the thinking, on the cognitive. Some people are stronger on the emotional. Uh, but I think poetry requires us to both think and feel. And I think, you know, psychoanalysis does the same. So that's one way that it's alike. Mm-hmm. The other way is that by the distancing, I found that psychoanalysis, by telling your story, it helps you look at it and just get a little bit more distance because part of what happens to us is we get engulfed or, you know, it it, it just sort of takes us over whatever it is that's, you know, that's emotion, whatever it is in our story. So, you know, like what I was saying about being able to feel something and take a bit of distance, that's another similarity. Mm-hmm. And I suppose the other one is just the psychoanalysis. It really trusts the unconscious. It really trusts that there are things we just don't know. It really trusts mystery. And sure, that's what poetry is all about. So, you know, I think to, to, you know, to write, you have to be able to trust not knowing. You have to trust where there aren't answers. You have to trust all these questions. And the more you can let yourself kind of be, because psychoanalysis is also about play. One of the things you try and do with working with people in psychotherapy is you want to try and let them play with the words they use. You listen very carefully to their words. You listen carefully to their images and you try and help them be aware of the kind of language they're using. I mean, again, isn't that so like what we're doing in, in you know, and so, you know, the imagery that, that works for me is not going to be the imagery that will work for somebody else. Everybody has their own, uh, you know, store of, of, of images, you know, and, and that's what happens in the, in when you're working with people in, you know, a psychoanalytic way, you're listening for what expresses them. But, you know, so sorry, if I just repeat again, that playfulness, how to be playful about what's very serious. I think that's part of what's important in and I don't I find all of this, you know, this is what I'm learning myself and always trying to remind myself of, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So those are the similarities, I think. Yeah, the I, yeah too. It, it, it's so fascinating that the way that play has to come into play. <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean we have to have fun and sort of relax and let the let the unconscious come to the surface. I think if yeah. a, you know poems don't work unless they're coming, you know, speaking to us on that level, and it's yeah. almost like we've found a way to bridge 
the gap into our subconscious. And then we're sharing that sort of map into some new experience, some new understanding with other people by writing the poem down. But we need to be able to find that place. Um, is yeah. there any way that, that, that psychotherapy has helped you um, access that space as a poet? Like, are there, are there tools that you've learned in psychoanalysis training that, that unlock that, you know, access to the subconscious that, yeah. that for you as a writer? I suppose, I think, I'm not sure if this will answer your question, but I remember because the, the kind of psychotherapy that I trained and that I worked in was group psychotherapy. So mm -hmm. group, so it's psychoanalytic perspective, but it was in a group setting. And one of the things that really struck me there was that I'd tell a story or somebody else would tell a story. And we were all, you know, the humanity, the universality, which can be really surprising to you. And it's one of the ways this is why group really works, because people feel, realize they're not alone and realize. And you see, I think that's what helps that helped me then in my writing. It helped me maybe put things into my work that otherwise would feel too exposing. But, you know, look, I'm not alone in this, you know, if if if. If I can, and the oh yeah, the other thing was about truth, how to, how to be as truthful as you can. Now I know then we create something out of it, you know. So it, again, it's a mix. I'm not saying that every poem is about; it's not autobiographical, but there's an emotional truth to get in touch with, mm -hmm. and and to trust, you know. I suppose what I learned in psychotherapy is to try and get more and more truthful. That's when people relate to you. You know, the more truthful you are, the more others can relate to you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I try and do my poetry as well. Um, so, so those are the ways in which psychotherapy, I think, has, has really helped me. Because I think a lot, you know, a lot of our training in, in ordinary everyday life is to hide the truth and to forget that we're so connected to others and to be feel ashamed about all the things we share with others. Mm -hmm. And the less shame you have and the less of that hiding of the truth, I think, helps you get more access to and those are all the places where our creativity is. Our creativity mm -hmm. is a lot of it is out of the places we hurt and where we're sad and where we're unsure. And so if we can, you know, being able to tap into those, being able to bear all of that, to tap into it, I think is for me was the gift of psychotherapy mm -hmm. that I think then helped me write. Yeah. And um, truth is so interesting, too, because it feels to me reading submissions like what I'm doing is almost like a truth detector. You know, I'm listening yeah. for the that there's some kind of voice that we bring yeah. out as poets when the poetry is working. And I'm, it's such a mystery of where it comes from or how it actually operates. But you can hear the truth. It's almost like a note in the background of a poem or something. And it, as I'm reading submissions for, for the magazine, you know, we get thousands that are sort of flipping through them really quickly. You can just hear it within a sentence or two that there's some truth you know, being told here. Um, and it's fascinating, too, that, that, that there's a difference between truth and fact. Um, yeah. And I, I'm wondering about, um, you know, because facts are sort of true in the moment right now, or, or like there's sort of a temporal way that they're true for like that specific instance. But there's a truth that's deeper than that, that's like true over time and space or something. Even if the facts are wrong, it's like more true than reality or something like that. And there's something to that too. Is that something that comes through in, in psychoanalysis too, that um, that there's, there's, a, there's a more true than the truth? Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. I mean, first of all, I think that the truth detector is a way of of assessing poems. I think that's really interesting. I could really relate to that. Um, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, in psychoanalysis, again, you're working with dreams, you're working with story, you're working with images. Again, so like the create, it's a very creative kind of process. And and I, I suppose I found in poetry that sometimes if you go away from the facts, you get greater truth. So it, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but it's just exactly what you're saying to free yourself up to find a deeper truth. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then, it, you know, uh, as well. And it's interesting because, of course, a lot of the time you're imagining 
you know, you're, you know, when you say about empathy, I mean, a big thing about empathy is you have to be able to imagine to empathize. And so when you're imagining, you may be wrong, you know, <laughs> you know, when you're imagining how someone else feels, when you're putting yourself in someone else's shoes, you don't know if you're right. But that, but that's what you're trying to do in in your poetry. So so yes, I suppose again, I think psychotherapy helped me but also reading helps you with empathy i mean novels help people isn't that i mean that's where novelists and poets are in the very same realm mm -hmm. you know whenever i you know the more i've been doing say commissions where i'm asked to write poems about something that's more distant from my own life mm -hmm. and that's that's difficult you know, I always find that challenging, but that's where I feel that in some ways it's more like the novelist because you take something that's a bit more distant, you bring yourself to it, but out of something distant, you try and make a truth, you know, that will resonate with others, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and too, and I think, um, you know, I think it's more, more empathetic than a novel, though, because we're using the breath, like the breath is the medium of the poem. And yeah. and I think that's in, in psychotherapy, it's all spoken to. So there's something akin to that as well, because it's a it's a speaking, it didn't, I think it's a, the talking cure. Wasn't that yeah. what Freud used to call it? And, and where, yeah. you know, this is where, we're sort of playing the music of speech in someone else's lungs when we're sh yeah. when we're writing a poem and we're putting that into someone else's breath, and so there's yeah. something that really connects on that level. Um, That's right. So, yeah. so wh where do you think you mentioned? Um, you know that people have so much in common. Um, you know, in in having a group therapy shows that. Um, uh, what do you think that is like? Why do you think I, it feels to me too that there's some kind of um just more universality to humanity than we see in the day-to-day -day life. I was just thinking as you were talking about how um, um, randomness, I, I was listening to a radio lab episode on randomness years ago. And um, this, this teacher who teaches mathematical randomness was saying that she could ask you to write a list of numbers that look random. And then she could hold it up and know whether or not it's actually a random list or yours, because your ex expectation of randomness is so much less than what um, randomness actually is. Like randomness is way more random and you get like eight heads in, in a row sometimes. And that's how she knows that it's, it's that something that you didn't make up as if there's some really strangeness to it. And and there's a way that um, th that we do the same thing with, with, with you know, we think things are subjective, but there's so much in common between humans across yeah. all cultures, just the way we evolved. Um, yeah. Is that the source? Like, do you think we're tapping into like our common humanity? When you're writing a poem and that's the, the central to it. Absolutely. And isn't that why, you know, that's why Elizabeth Bishop could touch me. Hmm. Very, very different life, grown up at a different time. That's why Basho can touch me. That's why, you know, Yates can touch, you know, it's it's that common humanity, which you know, and it is that the, the you know that the struggles we have as human beings, we they're different at different times, but there's something those essential um, experiences are the same, and if we can, and you know, and that's why that's why people can feel you know that whole thing about we write so as not to be alone, we read so as not to be alone. That's why when people read so as not to be alone, it's because there's something that they read in a poem that makes them feel less alone, that that says something they'd like to be able to say. Mm -hmm. And like, so, for example, you know, when I'm trying to write a new poem and I, maybe I can't get going and I think there's nothing there, I read other poets. And, you know, often, very soon after I start reading, I start, I, I want to write. <laughs> and why is that? Because something that they're looking at or feeling or expressing has resonated with me. <laughs> Excuse me. No, no problem. Yeah. Um, I think we should have to take a sip of water. Um, let's do read another poem yeah. to make sure, because okay. I um, I love talking to poets, but then, you know, pe people want to hear poems, too, and I do, too. These are beautiful <laughs> poems. So let's do the, the Pit Ponies okay. of Glendison. 
Yes. OK, so I'll do the pit ponies one. And just to say this one was inspired by a conversation with uh, a former miner who told me about working with the pit ponies. Pit ponies of Glendasson, hitched to an eight hour shift in Britchens, Hames and Traces. They follow the miners carbide lights. Halt under hoppers, turn on a thruppence and lean into their collars to pull the five wagon train. Low set cobs from the curra, a piebald and two greys. Their hooves fall heavy as hammers on granite. They haul lengths of larch for pit props, pneumatic drills, boxes of gelignite and from time to time deliver injured men back to daylight. The miners pat their necks in passing and feed them windfall apples, comrades in toil and first to halt, legs locked at a sudden rumbling, a change in the air or the rush of running water. Yeah, and that was um, Pip Ponies of Glendasan and um, or Glendasson, I guess I should say. Um, and, and it's a beautiful example of, I think maybe this is a great poem, or your whole book is a great poem to share to people who say that, you know, why doesn't poetry rhyme anymore? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, there is no end rhyme in these poems, but there's so much internal rhyme going on, um, you know, and slant rhyme. And, you know, even like, you know, follow the miners, the under hoppers and the collars, you know, there's that there's all those, you know, shifting and changing rhymes. It's it's so clear the the, the way that we write poems now, the jazz of it, the, the, the sort of the free play to, to have mm -hmm. these kind of echoes of rhyme coming through. Mm -hmm. um, is that something how did you develop that as a voice and how do you go about writing poems that are so rich in rhyme without regularity? Yeah, well, so I think we're talking about music, aren't we, here? Mm -hmm. I know rhythm and rhyme, the music. And I always put, well, I put some of this down to having Gillian Clark. I don't know if she's a Welsh poet, wonderful mm -hmm. Welsh poet. And she was my tutor when I did a master's in creative writing in Wales. I did it on, you know, distance learning. So I went over once every few months to Wales for two years. And Gillian was my tutor. And so every every six weeks, every two months, I'd go over with six poems and Gillian would always talk about the music in the lines. So I think those two years it was like having piano lessons for two years, if you know what I mean, yeah. and, and having the same thing pointed out to you. And I think she really helped me in, you know, take that in bodily. You know, it wasn't just here. I was taking it in in all of me. And. And now I find that my it's like my heart wants those sounds, if that makes sense, because mm -hmm. I could say it's my head wants those sounds, but it feels like it's not just my head, you know, that, that it's my heart that I love those tunings through a poem. Mm -hmm. I love when that happens. It's, but it, now it's not that I have to work at it so much. I know it, it does not. It's not that writing a poem is easy, and not that getting it right is easy, mm -hmm. but the tuning kind of happens as I'm, and I sit. You know, I sit here in this room, and I say it again and again and again. And I can't have any music on. I can't have anybody in the room. I have to just listen to it, mm -hmm. and, and and really get the sound. And and as I do that, the words come to do with the sound you know and and you just love that you know you you know when I'm doing it I love holler uh, the collars and hoppers I just love that mm -hmm. I love you know um you know the truppens I love that sound truppens you know and I, it's interesting the more I write the more I love the sound of words you know and the more aware I am of the sound and the more I love words. You'd think that, you know, working with words every day, you might get fed up of it. Mm -hmm. But I just thought the more and more and these very simple, ordinary, everyday words, seeing the music in them and how the music reveals all kinds of other levels of meaning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so 
that so that's how it happens it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right to say that it's a cognitive thing i don't think mm -hmm. Ooh, I, I mean i can't really explain properly but isn't isn't is it a bit like the way we love music you wouldn't say you love music with your brain would you i'm not sure how do we love what makes us love music but mm -hmm. whatever it is i think that's what goes into the poetry you yeah. know mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I love that analogy of a music lesson, because that really feels like what it is, like you're learning to play an instrument and the instrument is is the human voice. Um, and yes. there's a lot of ways you can go about doing that. You can go about just like you could just pick up a guitar and fiddle with it for 30 years and eventually you could know how to play guitar or you could take lessons and have people teach you the best techniques and then you learn it faster maybe. But still, it's learning an instrument. And then once you do, you you yeah. have that ability to play and you sit down and you start playing with words. Um, and yeah. I, I think too, you know, I, I was thinking as you were talking about how I love the way you're reading right now. Um, it's a beautiful, you know, use of that voice that that heightens the language a little bit, but not too much. And um, and I was thinking about how I used to love doing, uh, you know, going to live poetry readings, like up on, a, you know, someone up at a podium. I loved yeah. watching the poet's feet because my favorite yeah. poets, they all are sort of tapping and moving their feet a little bit. You know, it's not like yeah. a, a huge dance, but they can't yeah. not move as they're reading their poems. And I bet that you're moving your feet a little bit as you read these. And, um, and it's just, it brings out that music. And, and the other thing I, I'm thinking about too, because we were talking about psychoanalysis is to me, it seems like, um, like what we're, I, I get, is there, a, is there a mythological story where somebody like sings the lions to sleep or something? I'm imagining like that the music is putting our consciousness to sleep kind of. It's like a lullaby for our sort of left brain. And then, yeah. and then once that consciousness that's sort of always scattered and focused and jumping around and, and those fleeting thoughts that we have that are so useless kind of in a way, um, yes. you are putting that to sleep with the music so that the unconscious can emerge. Do you feel that is part of the process? Yeah, I know that's it's really interesting. I think this well, what I what that reminds me of is that when you're absorbed in the music of the words, say when you're making them and then when you say them again, you do it does it you are putting the conscious worries about the everyday are aside because you're concentrating on the these words and getting their the music in them. And of course, isn't that how lullabies always work? No wonder lullabies are so important in our lives, because it's just doing exactly what what you said, that the lullaby soothes something internal. Um and and that that's what what the music of poetry can do as well it can soothe and reassure um and and connect um so yeah it's funny just when you were saying that you know traditional irish musicians tap their feet all the time you know we were watching them just last night at the at the fla you know where all the musicians are out playing you know and they're just tapping their feet all the time just exactly what you said mm -hmm. and you know when you're listening to them playing your attention is drawn to their feet what they're doing with the rhythm on the floor so it's it's just exactly what you're saying you know and lots of poets speak with their hands as well i'm yeah. Mm -hmm. a bit. But Paula Meehan, for example, the Irish poet, she would she talks, you know, does her rhythm with her hands as well when she's reading, you know. Yeah, yeah we get our body into it because it's a dance, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. we're, we're sort of learning that dance of breath. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm doing a bad job of focusing on poems. We've got to do more poems. Let's do <laughs> crossings. Next. Yes, poem. Crossings. Yeah. Yes. Uh, wait, wait, see. <clears throat> So this poem um, was inspired by uh, thinking about the border between um, South of Ireland and the North of Ireland um, and me realising how many ways people cross this border. Crossings. A gap in a hawthorn hedge. Stepping stones in a stream. An oak log slick with frost. A three arch masonry bridge. A cow path down to a river where boulders span the width. A space between two barbed wire strands. A five bar gate. A by road. A railway line. A deer run. A coffin path. A stile in a dry stone wall. A path between two peaks. A rowboat on a lake. A bramble laced bridle path. A fire break through conifers, 
a granite lintled sheep creep, a butter path, a footbridge over a burn, two breeze blocks and a plank, whalery sleepers laid in a bog. Yeah, another beautiful poem, a list poem. Um, you know, no no verbs in that poem, just listing out and then letting you, you know, come to your own conclusions about these images that were sort of laying one after the other. Um, another beautiful way to write and an example of some of the variety that, that the music of the book allows, you know, we can move through, but just because those images are so musical and beautiful, um, you know, it holds your attention completely. Um, without having to have any action, just having those images there. Um, mm. Can you can you talk? We haven't talked really about. We had the title. The title was in the last poem, a change in the air, the very end. And and this is a book that moves through a lot of different subject matter. At first, I thought it was going to be you know the, looking back at memory and working with that, but then it moves through the the mining history um, and a lot of personal things more toward the end. Um, how did the book come together, and why was a change in the air the title that you chose? Well, actually, it was my editor, Neil Astley and Blood Axe, who, you know, because I I wasn't finding a title and he suggested it and I had to kind of sit with it for a while. And then I thought, no, that's right. That is the title that works. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, so I was very grateful for it. Um, so, yeah, how it came together was, uh, yeah, well, I was writing it over four years. And in that time, you see, um, COVID was within that, you know, so two years or maybe five years I was writing it. But, you know, yeah, two two years of that was COVID. And so so I had a lot of time here at home in Wicklow. So this book became much more a Wicklow uh, book. I suppose also I was I had wanted, you know, I've been interested in the natural world forever and ever, but poetry brought me much more into it. And in the last five years, I've learned much more, you know, with my naturalist friends, my ecologist friends. I've been listening to them and learning with them about you know, what we're seeing when I'm hill walking, when I'm walking around rivers. So that was another influence. And of course, the consciousness of the environmental crisis. I mean, again, like I've known about this for years, but there's I mean, the last five years has brought it to the fore you know, so much more, even the last year, even the last few months, all the time. So that's definitely in this book mm -hmm. um, and a sense of the preciousness of the world around us and it being under threat. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely in the book. So that's why the title, the title worked for me in terms of a change in the air. I think a change in the air can be used either as something very ominous mm -hmm. or as something hopeful. And that seemed to me to fit you know, and so again, yeah, as you say, change like, you know, my mother's dementia, my, um, you know, uh, but there's also cultural change. The whole thing about marriage equality in Ireland and mm -hmm. being able to, you know, marry, marry my wife after, you know, 20 years together, you know, all of that kind of change is in it, you know, but also, you know, changes in the environment you know, restoration in the environment, all of that, you know, so there's both, you know, so wherever there is the loss in environment, I also have poems about restoration. So it's that two sides of change, mm -hmm. I suppose, is what I'm um, exploring right through it. I'm sorry, just even to say those those group of border poems, they are both sides of change because putting the border into Ireland, you know, that, mm -hmm. you know, in 1921, when it was, that was... It was a wound in the landscape as the women who I, you know, talked to for these poems. That's what they called it, mm -hmm. a wound in the landscape. And then what people made of that wound is what I've explored in these poems based on what they said to me and based on my own sense of it. Um, um, yeah, so th that's how the I think the title works Mm -hmm. well be about the book yeah know? yeah definitely well put the, the ambiguity of it that the, what kind of change yeah. it could be because i've you know you look back at the title and sometimes it's like you say you know there's a change is up this positive thing this sort of feeling of more um sort of equality and generosity and things like that but then there's yeah. also a, a sense of ominousness too and with when you think of it in the context of other poems so you know yeah. you know we yeah. move forward in many ways and, and back and in other ways, you know, at the same time. And, and that really brings that about. Let's read the next poem, uh, Lazy Beds. 
lazy beds. So just to explain, lazy beds are these ridges, ridge, ridge and furrow that are in uplands all over Ireland. You'll see them particularly on the western west coast, but we have them over here in the east as well. And it's where the land will be very poor. And so you couldn't grow anything there unless you uh, heap up the earth. And that's where people grew potatoes. So this is very linked to the famine because people were surviving on potatoes and then there was the blight. Um, so lazy beds. In the shelter of Fancy Mountain, a man and woman rented an acre of rocky soil. Peregrine falcons soared from their nests in the cliffs, while the couple gleaned stones for a two-room hut and a goat pen. They sliced through roots of black bog rush and deer sedge, dug into peat, cutting and turning sod onto sod. They planted potatoes when stone chats slashed, clashed pebbles into song. The ridges resisted frost, held flinders of heat. After the famine, the valley was cleared for sheep, tenants shipped to grow seal. Ewes still graze the heat, rain still ripples down the furrows they built. And once in a while, wind whips water into twisters that dance the width of Loch Tay. Hmm. Another beautiful poem that was Lazy Beds by Jane Clark from her newest book, A Change in the Air. Um, if anybody has any questions for Jane, please leave them in the chat windows either on Facebook or YouTube. I'm keeping an eye on both. If you, It helps if you do put question like in all caps or something before you start so I can make sure I, I know that's a question. Um, uh, but in the meantime, Jane, I, I want to talk a little bit about poetry in Ireland, because, of course, this, you were in the Irish Poets issue. And I don't know if we have a romantic notion of how poetry is treated in Ireland, you know, here in the States. But I imagine and I've you know heard people say that it's it's just much more appreciated than it is here just by the general public. Um, do you do you find that? And, and how what, what's your experience like, you know, with poetry? Um, as an Irish poet, um, you know, growing up first and then and then now that your, you know, your poems are well received and are on, you know, Radio 4 most recently and, and things like that. Um, yeah. What is the, the, the public's experience with poetry there? Yeah, I think I think it's it's really interesting. I think it's two things that I think there is a real openness to poetry and a real respect for poets and poetry. But there also is a, a sense of maybe being intimidated and mm. it's not really for something that you'd read, you know, it, it yourself. People not sure it, about maybe contemporary poetry mm. yet, you know, you know, there's poetry on the radio every Sunday morning. There's poetry on the radio. There's poetry in the in this program of country issues every Saturday morning. They include poetry. Um, so it and there's poetry in the Irish Times every Saturday. All of those things are really good. They're all ways to help people have access to poetry. Um, and, you know, so when Seamus Heaney died, for example, there really was mourning. People felt it personally. It wasn't just a mm -hmm. famous person dying. People, it was incredible, the response. And it was that people knew his poems. Like if you, you know, if people say, oh, people don't think about poetry. If you go back and listen to the radio programs, that response, I know Seamus Heaney is special, but the fact that all these people had his poems and they'd say, that's the one I love. And that poem mattered at that time in my life. Mm -hmm. I think that says a lot. And Yeats, of course, so many people loving Yeats. You know, Derek Mahan's poem during lockdown, a Derek Mahan poem meant the world to people. You know, everything is going to be all right. People, you know, that made a difference in people's lives. So I'd say overall, the, the relationship with poetry is good, but maybe it doesn't translate a lot into buying contemporary collections of poetry, mm -hmm. I, you know, so there's a bit of a divide there. I mean, and I suppose just in my own life growing up, like I suppose the thing is, I, I was born in 1961. OK, and so in the 60s and 70s in, you know, in my my primary school, you know, poetry was 
really important in every day. And as was song, though, traditional songs and ballads. And I think they're very related. I think that influenced me. And then, you know, my father quoted poetry, which is kind of amazing to think of now. You know, he was a farmer quoting poetry. He was quoting and, he, you know, he'd give out about a Paddy Kavanaugh poem and, you know, and... <laughs> But the fact that he was giving out about a poem, it meant it was very real in our lives. Do, mm -hmm. do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I think that's what's important. If people can have it in a real way in their lives, that's what I would wish for people to have with poetry. I think too often people feel it's something esoteric, something that that can't touch their lives, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the only it reminds me of um, how um, talking to Richard Gilbert and some others about how haiku is tr is treated in in Japan, you know, there's sort of a reverence for it, but also yeah. people are you know regular people feel a little intimidated. They say, "Oh, I'll write senru, but I don't write haiku because that's too much." Yeah. <laughs> and I, and yeah. you know, it, it's really interesting. And, and just to imagine though that that poetry has that place, it's not something, you know, it's something so many people are almost embarrassed to do. It's almost like. Yeah. Like if you tell somebody the, in, in the States, if you write, like I, if I'm flying on a plane, if people say, what do yeah. you do? I say, oh, I edit a magazine. What kind of magazine? Oh, a poetry magazine. And they say, oh, <laughs> and they, <laughs> you know, and there's this sort of awkwardness yeah. to it where they don't know what to say. Yeah. Um, and then the, then a few people, those out of nowhere, always say, you know, I, you know, I write poems, too, in my journal, but I would never share them, which is a really interesting. Like my um, yeah. uh, my neighbor was a biologist. And he confessed to me that he has a diary full of poems. He's never shown anybody that he writes while he's out doing field work. And so there's sort of this undercurrent of poetry here. But on the surface, it's this um, almost an yeah. embarrassment. It's like a self-indulgence, maybe, that we think about it. Um, yeah. Is there any sense of, of poetry feeling self-indulgent in Ireland? Is, is that any part of it or is I it not at all? So. No, I, I wouldn't say I have felt that. And it's interesting when I would say to people I'm a poet, they always say, well, what kind of poetry? Mm -hmm. So that's a good sign in a way, <laughs> it isn't is, it? That is, yeah. You know, that they're not turned off. They're just kind of wondering, is it something I could read? I think that's what people are looking for. Would I be able to make sense of it? Mm -hmm. But the other thing I remember of my father's wake, there were all these farmers coming in or hundreds of people came to my father's wake but so many of them they'd meet me because I was the only daughter and they'd say are you the poet you know and I think that's interesting that they you know they had maybe read something in the local newspaper or something but that they were interested that you were a poet hmm. you know yeah so so I do think that there's a respect for poetry um and I yeah and I think I I think that's I think we're lucky about that in Ireland, that, that we haven't lost that, you know, because I suppose poetry, you know, it is this ancient art. It's so ancient. Mm -hmm. um, and if it's still relevant in our lives today, I think that's just just a, a wonderful, a wonderful thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, you know, poetry is really the second tool, I think, you know, it's the mm -hmm. we had the hand yeah. axe and then we had the, the poem that allowed us to, mm -hmm. to share things and create myths. And so it's that yeah. central to, you know, going back 200,000 years. Um, yeah. And it is just it's, it's a great feeling to be able to carry it on, you know, even though we have yeah. so much else swirling around us that we could have never imagined. We still have this yeah. sort of really fundamental way of being human. Um, let, let, let's keep the poems going. We have three more. I want to do all three if, if okay. it's okay. I think we're going to go okay. over the time. If you're, do you have to rush off anywhere? No, no, I'm fine. Okay, yeah. well, let's do, I'm, let's do recipe yeah. for a bog then. then we'll, recipe we'll for a bog. Yeah. And just to say, this is, um, uh, inspired by the restoration work that's happening. There's all kinds of wonderful restoration work happening by environmentalists. And this is inspired by environmentalists, neighbors of mine in County Wicklow. Recipe for a bog. Block the gullies and grips where the river rises. Slow the downhill flow of peat-filled streams. Fell spruce and pine that thirst for moisture. Mulch parched earth with heather brush. Graft sphagnum moss from a healthy bank. Lay straw, feather light on fragments. Welcome rain, gaze at puddles spreading into ponds, count frogs. Watch emperor moths in cotton grass, a spider trapped on sundew tendrils, dragonflies skittish from butterwort to asphodel, and a pair of low-flying merlin, wingbeat, wingbeat, glide. 
Yeah. What recipe for a bog from uh, A Change in the Air, Jane Clark's newest book. Um, let's see. We have some questions from the audience. Um, Dick Westheimer wanted to know, um, how much of this work is based on personal experience and how much on research? Um, like the, the few you've read are, are clearly about re are research based. So how much what's the balance like that in your work? Is it yeah. has it been a transition? I think earlier on, right, you were writing more personally. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the commissions I've got in the last number of years requires research. Um, and so, yeah, I, I do lots of research. I find it really interesting. I love what I'm learning because of my writing, because you get you find yourself learning about things you wouldn't have looked up otherwise. So, yeah, there's definitely research. But then I don't think you could make it into a poem without your own response to that. So it has to be personal because otherwise it would be just like writing a report. You know, you write the research, you do a summary of the research. That's not it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's that that's the that's the alchemy of it is the combination of the personal and the learning, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then following up on that, too, um, how much so, so you've had a lot of success lately. You know, the, the last few years, you've really your, your career as a poet has taken off. Um, yeah. And how has that changed, you know, getting commissions like that? How has that changed your writing process? Do you feel sort of a different sense of responsibility, maybe, because you know that, you know, people are actually going to read these poems for one, and then, you know, that you have some kind of, you know, like you owe it to whatever you're writing about to share it in a, in a way that's meaningful? Yeah, well, look, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I'd say if you asked me that even a year ago or 18 months ago, I might have said, oh, I'm really, you know, I'm not sure about commissions. I'm not sure if I do enough quality work with commissions because I was worried about that. Mm -hmm. I was worried that, you know, because you're asked to do something that you're making some. But actually, I, you know, there's an awful lot of work in this book that has come from commissions and I feel it is quality work mm -hmm. and that it pushes me to do different kind of poetry and that I can be surprised what comes out of commissions. So, for example, this summer, the, the most recent poem I've written is from a commission. Killarney National Park asked me to go down and uh, do a piece about a particular road that where there's a lot of desert, deserted homesteads along a road that's it's now just a walking road. It can't be driven. And I, you know, a poem came from that. I wouldn't have written that myself, but I think it's a good poem. And so, but of course, the, they asked me to write that because they knew I was interested in nature and knew I was interested in hill walking. Do you know what I mean? I don't think I could write a poem, say, about science. I don't think that would work for me. It has to be something that gets my heart going, mm -hmm. you know. So it's not that I can just do any commission. I've been lucky that the commissions I've been given uh, resonate with me, with my own heart and my own, you know, you know, what gets some kind of energy. Isn't there some kind of energy that has to take off to make a poem happen, you know? Yeah, well, I imagine, you know, our next issue of Rattle is a, a prompt poem. So poems based on writing prompts. And we have a writing prompt at the end of every Rattlecast and share those on the open lines later, uh, which I should remind everybody, if you'd like to share a poem, for the open lines, we're going to be uh, sharing the Zoom link, and then you can share poems um, about the current uh, the current prompt or anything else. But but it seems like writing on commission, which is something that doesn't happen in the states very often. And I mean, I'd love it if it happened more. Yeah. Just commission me to write poems. But it feels like in the same way a prompt poem works, you know, where you yeah. don't. It, it's a it's a jumping out point, and then you can let your own you know proclivities and consciousness and idiosyncrasies take off and mm -hmm. run with it. And, and you yeah. come up with surprising things just based on the fact that you, um, you know, have that starting point that's sort of something you wouldn't pick yourself. And I yeah. think it's a really fun thing to do to see how you can surprise yourself and how you, the, the topic can can connect to you, even though you didn't think it did. So I think I, yeah. I love that concept. I kind of wish we did more of that in the U.S. Yeah. I mean, just to say, I never thought of it like that before, but that is it exactly. You know, that is it. And I think that's, again, about the freeing of the unconscious, freeing the conscious, mm -hmm. putting it aside because it's something unexpected. So you have to kind of go with the unexpected in it. Yeah. So that's that's a good way of, of, of putting it. And I mean, just to say some of these commissions came about because festivals couldn't go on during COVID, oh, during lockdown. Mm -hmm. so people 
festival organizers used the money differently, which I think was a great idea. Mm -hmm. So they commissioned artists to do some work in a different way. That was one of the ways. Oh, that yeah, happened. that's that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. And and yeah. I, I, th that it frees you too. it's a great way to put it. And, I, you know, yeah, that um, yeah. We're, we're all trying to find that freedom. And when I when yeah. I after I wrote my first book, I was having trouble writing my second. I wanted to write about my father who's a really complicated figure and it was meaningful and, and I haven't written it yet. But, um, you know, I tinkered with it. But um, um, I could I would get stuck up by having to having something I wanted to write about. And the only yeah. way I could find I could break it was I made this ridiculous writing exercise that made no sense whatsoever. And that just freed yeah. me up to write about whatever. And, and it was, so you need some kind of way to be free. Like you can't Absolutely. have um, and Zen in the Art of Archery. They talk about having a too much willful will. And I think yes. that really gets in the way of us as writers. Um, yeah. Uh, let, let's read um, Spalls and then we'll talk a little bit more and then we have stepping in too. Yeah. Okay. Um, Spalls is 65. Okay. Yeah. So this is the last poem that went into the book. And uh, I think it's uh, self-explanatory, except to say that spalls are the little stones that go into making a dry stone wall to hold it together. Spalls. To help us grow a garden, my mother and father travelled across the Bog of Allen and over the Wicklow Gap. They'd have preferred to drive west to Galway or Mayo. They'd have preferred a husband and children but their daughter loved a woman. We'd have the table set for breakfast, rashers, black pudding, fried bread and eggs. When the soil had warmed, we unloaded shovels and rakes, buckets of compost and the rusted iron bar for prizing out rocks. The back seat was thronged with pots of seedlings my mother had nurtured all winter. We work to her bidding. Loosen tangle roots before planting. Sow marigolds next to beans. Sprinkle Epsom salts around roses. My father took off on his own to spud ragwort or clip a hedge. One day he spent hours gathering stones of different shapes and sizes. By evening he'd built us a wall under the holly held together by gravity and friction, hearted with handfuls of spalls. Mm. Yeah, another, these are all just so beautiful. That was Spalls from A Change in the Air by Jane Clark. And, um, you know, speaking back about that beauty again, um, Nate Jacob asked, um, let me find his question. It was a little higher up, I think. Um, oh, where do I want to read? Oh, yeah, here. Does Jane write her first drafts so chock full of sound play or is she editing into it? Either way, it's gorgeous. So, so how, yeah, how much of that is in the editing process and how much is just, uh, you know, the first draft comes out with music? Um, I think there's a good bit of music in the first draft. And actually, my editing is getting rid of things, taking out, taking out. So there could be a lot in the first draft and then taking out. And I think that taking out then increases the musicality. But it's not so much putting in as taking out, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so like I remember this first draft because this was done last summer and there was a lot more in it, you know, I, I, but but I just, you know, took out what wasn't what what wasn't needed. Um, but yeah. And, and I mean, just to go back to his question, his lovely question. For me, often it is the music of that first line that gets the poem going, you know, that one, you know, my to help us grow, God, my mother and father traveled across the bog of Allen and over the week. So then I had the poem, if you like. The poem follows on. It's like you get a get a rhythm going. You know, the way uh, Ruth Stone used to say that writing a poem was like trying to run for a train. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. It's like, so I think of this, the train is pulling out of the station and you're running to grasp it. So that's a bit like that. There's, you know, there's a rhythm started. And can you hold on to that rhythm and then use it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. It's, I mean, that's exactly how I feel writing too. That the first line creates the music of the rest of the yeah. poem, you know. And once, mm -hmm. if you once you find the first line, it's like that 
enters into the poem and then you can write a poem but until you find yeah. a first line i can't write about anything like it's all yeah. you need to find yeah. the music and it's interesting too um on our critiques that we do on fridays um sometimes you see a poem or, or maybe i'm thinking of someone else somewhere i saw a poem recently where i felt like um they just picked the wrong music in the very beginning yeah it was a poet's yeah. response submission that's what i'm thinking of but uh, but we had a, a submission where i loved the content and there were great lines but there was this sort of stilted music to it which just from the first line and i you yeah. know i would have written back to the person if i had time to write to everybody and say yeah. like, like write this poem again but but come up with a different first line and different music because yeah. then you know it threw you off it was like a wrong trail that you went down now the whole poem is in like the wrong valley <laughs> but um yeah, absolutely. But yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really interesting how that plays out. Yeah, and maybe just say as well, just to add to what the, to the last person's question, say a word like flinders, which was in the poem um, Lazy Beds. I didn't have that initially. Mm -hmm. I just came across it afterwards and I thought, oh, yeah, that fits, you know. So it isn't that all the words you have initially, you know, it's like, you know, the way you're carrying a poem around with you. And sometimes you hear a word and you think, oh, yeah that'll work there because I think it's because the, the poem is in your unconscious. So then you're finding words when you're going around, mm -hmm. hopefully, luckily, if you're fortunately, if you find them, then you can put them in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and um, Dick Westheimer here was reading my mind because I was going to ask about the same thing. He says, all these poems fit on one page. Um, is it an intentional limit? And, and I, I did notice that, too. And, you know, I'd only noticed it halfway through the book. So I don't know if all the poems I wasn't looking for that at the beginning. So I don't know if maybe there's some two page poems earlier on. But but most of the poems in the book are fit on one page. There's something about that length that draws you to it. I was thinking about, um, you know, like some things we have, like the number of digits we can remember. There's a certain number of letters we can remember. So there's like and there's the, the Dunbar's number of like 150 people we can kind of keep track of socially. There's certain like psychological reasons for things. And then there's also some things we have that are completely arbitrary, like the width of a railroad track um, is, is because like the ancient Roman, um, you know, um, chariot had a certain wheel axle width because they could fit two cows there. And then the ruts ended up being that wide. So we made the train tracks that wide so they could fit through the trail, you know. And so it's totally arbitrary. Um, is there a reason that this length um, works like in, in music too? like there's a sort of a three minute song like we like a song that's three minutes because it feels yeah. sort of like it went somewhere and is complete. But then that's like enough. So is there something to the, the intrinsic yeah. to that length or not? Well, just to say it's not that it's intentional, but it's that. You know, whenever I do longer, I I take it out because it doesn't seem necessary. I want to I do want it to be concise. That is my aesthetic. But I do love the sonnet. There's something about the 14 line. You know, I think so much can be expressed in 14 lines. And often my 14 lines becomes 18 or maybe 21. But that's about it, mm -hmm. you know. But it's not it's not intentional and it's not that I mean, I would love to write a longer poem that really worked. But any of my longer poems, they tend they don't you know, they tend to be kind of flabby and you just need to let it go, cut it back to what's necessary. You know, I can't write a longer poem just for the sake of it. If you see what I mean, mm -hmm. I have to write, you know, the poem tells you how long it needs to be. You know, I mean, I suppose I think more sometimes of sequences is like a long poem. If you see what I mean, that there'd be different that allows that's that's how I can go at something with a bit more length by writing different poems, smaller poems that together make something that works better for me, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, we'll have uh, one last question. I, I'm just wondering and then we'll yeah. do the last poem. Um, but what are you working yeah. on now? Now that this book is out, um, are there any yeah. sort of things that you're drawn to topically you find yourself like what, what's uh, in, in progress? Yeah, well, and the environmental crisis, I've, I've been asked to work with Burren Bio, it's a landscape charity in the west of Ireland, to work on the issue of environmental stewardship. So look, that's about farming, that's about meeting farmers, maybe interviewing them and see what, what comes up. So that's one thing. And then I've been in, asked to do a project on biodiversity loss for the Museum of Literature Ireland. I've written those poems. Um, I was working on the ones about national. Um, so I, I, 
I think very much at the moment the theme is oh in history. I I do history is another theme for me, and particularly women in Irish history who've been forgotten or left out. So I'm doing a, a sequence of poems about two women during the Irish Revolution. I've written maybe about five or six poems, but I feel there's more there to be done. So that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. And then always there are the more personal poems come in there, mm -hmm. you know. But maybe just also to say that I will be in the States in case there's anybody there from D.C. or Villanova or uh, Princeton. I'm going to be there giving some readings in September. So, you know, just to say that as well from the new book. I'll oh, be there. yeah, that's wonderful. And, and of course, we can find yeah. uh, those details, I'm sure, at janeclarkpoetry.ie, your website. And that's yeah. Clark with an E at the end, Jane Clark Poetry. Um, yeah. And, yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm sure that many people are looking forward to uh, what you're working on now because I think you have a lot of fans. It, it's interesting to watch the, um, you, know, you can see the, the, how much people admire a poet by how um, the audience increases as the show goes on. And uh, <laughs> we have more, more viewers than we did at the start. So that's wonderful. Um, right. Let's finish up with uh, the last poem you had for us, uh, Stepping In. Yeah, and uh, and just Tim, thank you so much for this opportunity and thanks to everybody who's online watching. So stepping in. Yeah, this is about swimming in our local river, but I suppose it's also about writing and any anything that takes a bit of courage in life. Stepping in. Rain stipples the river as you huddle for shelter, balancing on one foot to undress. Then clamber over the fence, for the down the bank scramble through cattails and hazel, bone cold awakening of skin. You ask yourself why, though your body remembers in every cell, lemon mossed pebbles, damselflies glancing on brooklime and alder, scent of the bog from above Glendasson and the current that takes you, alert, electric, alive. I think that was Stepping In from Jane Clark's <laughs> uh, newest book, A Change in the Air. Uh, thanks so much, Jane, for being a guest. It was wonderful talking to you. I love you know the whole discussion and the poetry, um, all of it beautiful. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yep. Thank you, Tim. Yep. Thank Bye. you. That was Jane Clark once again, today's poet. You can find more of her work at Jane Clark Poetry. Dot I E that's um Jane Clark Jane J A N E Clark with an E poetry dot I E I guess I'll put it on the screen so you can see the website but um you do find more of Jane's work in her previous two books too she uh, and all of them are wonderful um there you go so um there's Jane Clark poetry um now we're gonna take a quick break and go to our open lines if you would like to join us on the open lines um, I'm going to be putting the, let's see, where do I do it? I'm going to put in the, uh, the uh, link into the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube. And then there's two ways you can go about sharing poems. You can email it to um, openmic at rattle.com. That's openmic at rattle.com. Um, I'll put that, let's see, if I go to, forget this. Um, yeah, I don't have that. I, for, I keep forgetting to get this slide over in a new location. But you can email us to open mic. That's open M I C at rattle.com. I'll put that in the chat window too. But here's your Zoom link. And here is the open mic, open M I C at rattle.com. You can email the poem there or you can submit it through our new prompt poems category. Uh, for the open lines, we'll go for about an hour. You don't have to uh, do a prompt poem, you can do whatever you would like. Uh, you can do current events poems, you can do poems you published recently, poems you wrote recently, whatever you would like to share, feel free to do so and join in and we will uh, share as many poems as possible. I'm going to take a quick break and I'll be right back with more poetry. <laughs> Thank you. 
And we're back. Now, the prompt for this week um, was to, let's see, we are right here and then here. The prompt for this week was to write a villanelle that includes a cryptid. And that's a mythological creature like the Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, that kind of thing. Um, and a villanelle, of course, is that form where um, you know, there's a certain rhyme scheme. It's, it's three line stanzas. Um, um, and then there's a repetition. The first line of the of the poem becomes the I don't even know the sixth line of the uh, of the of the of the poem, or the yeah whatever. There's a rhyme scheme. You'll you'll get the gist when you see. If you don't know what a villanelle is, look it up. It's hard to describe verbally, but by looking at it, it's very clear to see. And so um, so that was the prompt to write a villanelle that includes a cryptid um, of some kind. And I went through. Um, um, I, I look for websites listing um, cryptids, like that kind of the mythological creature, in my own hometown of Rochester, New York. I was looking around, and I found one. I found an article that listed like 15 different sort of myths, like local urban legends about different cryptids, and um, and one of them was the, the Hellhounds of of Sodus Bay Cemetery. And this was these uh, stories of, and, and Sodus Bay I, is one place I lived for a year in Sodus, New York, next to my aunt um, in this little small town of Sodus when I was like one year old. So I thought I'd use that. There are these hellhounds that apparently people used to camp out when the, when, you know, the, the shows for, um, you know, online, the sci-fi channel and stuff had those shows. Some, some team people camped out to wait for the hellhounds of South Sodus Bay Cemetery and uh, I guess a lot of people camp out in that cemetery hoping to see these shadows of dogs creeping around the tombstones. Anyway, so this is my villanelle for the hellhounds of Sodus Bay Cemetery. We picnic with the dogs of the dead. It's better them than with the living, despite the looming sense of dread. At night they call us out of bed by howling for the breath they lack. We picnic with the dogs of the dead as if their hunger could be fed, as if we too could join the pack. Despite the looming sense of dread, we rise like loaves of leavened bread and stumble past the digger's shack to picnic with the dogs of the dead. Shadows on the stones, they spread fear, but we know they won't attack despite the looming sense of dread. Like us, they only want to shed what can't be shed, the empty black. We picnic with the dogs of the dead to spite the looming sense of dread. So that is my villanelle for the hellhounds of Sodus Bay Cemetery. And now the next time I go back home, I'm going to definitely um, check out that cemetery in the middle of the night, and we'll see how that goes. If I don't come back, you'll know why the hellhounds have taken me. But anyway, that was my uh, villanelle. This should have been, I realize, a, a prompt for... Um, the Halloween episode, because we are going to have um, the night before Halloween, Halloween Eve, uh, we will have uh, a, a, a spooky show as again, as we always do. I have a guest lined up for that. But now let's see what you have. And I'm first going to go to our prompt poems editor, I think. Uh, Katie Dozier is here. Hello, Katie. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I love the show today. It was like, a, it felt like spiritual for me and very calming. Like I know if I'm ever stressed out, I'm going to re-listen to this episode. So it was great. Excellent. Well, yeah. And um, let me just fix this too. I keep, um, so, so tell us about uh, what you have for your poem as I fix the. Um... All right. Yeah. Well, I'm not allowed to complain about the prompt. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I helped to create it, but everybody can complain, complain to me. I, I I thought it was pretty challenging, to be honest, and I was a little bit, I, I found it difficult, but fun, which is kind of the point, I think, of a lot of prompts. <laughs> and it was interesting that you all were talking about uh, so much about the music in the episode, because mine is called The Day the Music Died, after the American Pie song, of course. So. Oh, really interesting. And so ha have you written a Villanelle before? Is that the first time you wrote one? 
I think I've written one other villanelle and that's like not counting. Probably in college, I was, you know, chained to the desk to write a villanelle at some point. I mean, I think it's a great form. I just, you know, have learned about it, but I know that I have a long way to go to master it. Uh -huh. So. <laughs> okay. Well, let me, uh, let me see. Sorry, I was not prepared well enough. Okay, well, why don't I share a detail about <laughs> your prompt poem? Because I think everybody might be curious to know that Tim wrote that on the airplane by hand. I did, and I learned. Earth. I learned that <laughs> it is possible to write by hand. I used to tell myself that I couldn't, because I had to write fast enough, and it was hand was too slow. But a form like this, you know, uh, haiku worked really well, and, and forms you have to go slow because you have to get the meter and the rhyme right. Uh, they do work by hand. So maybe... Um, you know, the, the kind of rush of poet poems that I like the most or maybe it would be difficult by him. But uh, yeah, this worked well. So I think the plane, I'm going to not bother with a laptop and just write some kind of form every time I go. But anyway, I, I pulled the poem cool. and I fixed the, <laughs> the thing below you. So let's uh, let's hear it. The day the music died. OK, the day the music died after Don McLean. With the first of his hound heads, he thinks. And the second, he bears phosphorescent teeth while the dinner plate eyes of the third one blink. Upon the iron door, his claws clatter and clink. So I begin to sing American Pie underneath. With the first of his hound heads, he thinks. Quarter note spiral around his fur that stinks. And any darkness, music is a kind of wreath. The dinner plate eyes of the third galaxy blink. I push up from below this growling sphinx, muscle my way from the fire beneath. With the first of his hound heads, he thinks shooting every one of his interplanetary heads a wink. I sing, did you write the book of love? Notes unsheathed while the dinner plate eyes of the third head blink. A moth flies into my throat, my song jinxed. Cerebrus hoists me into the air with open jaws. And while the first of his hound heads, he thinks while the dinner plate eyes of the third hell blink. Yeah, beautiful poem. And that was a rush of a poem, speaking of which. <laughs> <laughs> it um, was a rush of a poem. The I should say, say too, it was inspired by my daughter's Roblox character. Uh -huh. She was walking around with this dog, and then I Googled this dog and found out it was a thing. And then I kind of conflated that with the singing dog in Harry Potter that would be quiet. <laughs> so that's where I went with that one, to my own weird place as normal. Yeah. Well, very good. Thanks for sharing that, Katie. And um, and we'll, we'll reveal your uh, prompt poem for, for prompt for next week at the end of the show of course we also do the poetry space together on twitter and uh, that's every thursday at 4 p.m eastern time yeah 4 p.m eastern time no 3 p.m shoot 3 p.m eastern time ah. i should have caught you on that 3 yeah. p.m eastern that's correct <laughs> <laughs> yeah and today uh, this week we're talking about so it's an hour sort of round table just talking about a topic this week is titles we're talking about mm -hmm. titles of poems and, and how to make a good title and, and what you know doesn't work for a title and etc so that'd be fun i uh, think of good examples of poems with uh with interesting titles um, and that'll be on the poetry space, but you can find it on Twitter, of course, if you follow either me or Katie there. But thanks, Katie, and we'll uh, we'll reveal your prompt at the end of the show. Thanks very much. I look forward to it being revealed, as I've forgotten it. <laughs> yeah, me too. So hopefully, I have it written down. But anyway, <laughs> thanks. We'll see you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. That was Katie Dozier with uh, the day the music died. And um, now let's go to, I think we have some new first-time callers. I want to go to Nivedita Karthik, though, first, because she's always running off to work at this time. Oh, wait, no, you're not running off to work, because we're not at the regular time. So, But let's uh, let's do that anyway, um, since I already mentioned it. And um, let's see what Nivi has for us today. Hi, Nivi, how are you doing? Hi, Tim, I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? It's good to see you. Yeah, I totally forgot that it's not the usual time, because usually you're getting up, you know, getting ready for work. But now you are, um, you must be after work, right? <laughs> uh, it's 11 p.m. Yeah, there you go. So hopefully uh, you're home by now. So what do you have? Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> what do you have to share with us? Um, I have a prompt poem. Uh-huh. Um, I think I concur with everybody. It was difficult to find a cryptid and then to write about it in the structured form. But it was a very good challenge. And thanks so much, Katie, for this. Uh, I think you pushed all of us out of our comfort zones and sort of made us take a leap into the unknown <laughs> um so this is sort of a rushed poem uh -huh. i sat with it from yesterday evening and this evening and this is what i got um so i chose a yeti um since it's close to the country i'm in mm -hmm. uh yetis are part of the himalayas and the himalayas are just north of india and nepal so i decided to write about that and since the villanelle is sort of like an 
older poetic form. I tried to write it in that style and not bring too much of the contemporary element into it. Uh, I don't know, it's still a work in progress, but this is what is there so far. Um, it's called A Himalayan Mystery. A Himalayan Mystery. Deep in the snow-shrouded Himalayan peaks, a silent stride. It's the Yeti, a legend to explore within the icy realms where secrets still reside. As legends and fact now collide, giant footprints leave whispery tracks on the frosty floor, deep in the snow-shrouded Himalayan peaks, a silent stride. Beneath the evergreen pines where shadows hide, the Yeti patiently stands, waiting for its encore within the icy realms where secrets still reside. Through frigid frosts, the Yeti will glide, keeping warm under layers of enigma and lore. Deep in the snow-shrouded Himalayan peaks, a silent stride. Through fierce blizzards where winds and snowflakes roaringly ride, a presence stirs, a presence right out of the misty folklore within icy realms where secrets still reside. Here, where ancient myths confide and divide, the Yeti rides, a snowy troubadour. Deep in the snow-shrouded Himalayan peaks, a silent stride within icy realms where secrets still reside. Oh, that's great. I love the uh, the snowy troubadour. <laughs> that's great. I mean, he is waiting for his encore, so mm -hmm. <laughs> he has to do something creative. Very good. Have you been up to the Himalayas? Uh, is it somewhere? Uh, I, I can't. It's... I try to imagine what it would be like to be in mountains. That, but even me living in mountains, um, it's, uh, it's okay, so uh, intimidating. I haven't been to the Himalayas, but uh -huh. while going on flights, when you cross through Nepal or Kathmandu, you do get to see the Himalayas mm -hmm. right outside your plane window, no matter how high you fly. So mm -hmm. that I've done, but <laughs> a trip just solely to the Himalayas or even the base camp. That's not something I've done, but something me and my husband are waiting to do. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and then look down the plane, you see a little tiny yeti. I'm sure, right when you're flying into Nepal. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Nivi. It's great. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Have a lovely day. You too. Okay, that was Nivedita Karthik with um, a Himalayan mystery, and uh, let's do go to our first timer. So we, uh, or maybe I think we've had Nancy uh, Nancy Tunnel before, but not very often. Maybe so. Hi, Nancy. How are you doing? I'm good. And this was hard, Katie. I had never written a villanelle, but uh, I wrote one about a vampire mm. and then thought, no. And then I felt like I had to purge a little bit. So I wrote a normal villanelle about a garden and then came back to write about our own local cryptid, which no one has heard of, I'm sure, mm -hmm. uh, here in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, it's right in the end of town I live in, there's a legend about the Pope Lick Creek monster. And mm -hmm. uh, it's, well, the Villanelle sort of tells his story. Very interesting. Yeah, I've never heard about it either, even despite listening yeah. to a lot of Art Bell and uh, <laughs> those type of shows. Never heard of the Pope Lick monster. Very Pope interesting. Lick Creek is it? creek that runs near eastern Jefferson County mm -hmm. and there's a railroad trestle that is the subject of legend uh, but here's the villanelle okay yes he waits under the trestle over Pope Lick Creek where the lives of many have come to an end people who wanted their chance to seek the Pope Lick monster of whom I speak part man part goat near the Norfolk southern bend Yes, he waits under the trestle over Pope Lick Creek. We have heard the stories of his evil deceit, his voice mimicking that of a hurt child or a friend, people who wanted their chance to seek them, who then climbed the trestle, its entire 10 feet, became trapped there when the train came around the bend. Yes, he waits under the trestle over Pope Lick Creek. In the dark of the night, the crew, though elite, could not see, could not stop as people met their end. People who wanted their chance to seek the monster who waits for a chance to speak to anyone traveling on this fool's errand. Yes, he waits under the trestle over Pope Lick Creek with people who wanted their chance to seek. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I love that. I've never, uh, I've never heard of that, but I love that cryptid. <laughs> well, people, people really have. It's usually teenagers. They, they go there. It's sort of uh, shrouded in trees, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, is isolated. And they go there to scare their girlfriends. <laughs> you know, with the legend of the seek 
the goat man and mm -hmm. then they climb that trestle and really get in trouble. Yeah, I'm sure they do. That, that's... There's been a lot of protest <laughs> with the railroad that they need to do something. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, they've posted signs that say, do not climb the trestle. Yeah, that's almost like a sign saying, please climb the trestle, teenager. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That was great. Pope Lick right. Vanel. I appreciate it. Yeah, and that was um, Nancy Tunnell with uh, Pope Lick Villanelle. Uh, let's go next to um, Deidre Dimonescu. Dimonescu, sorry. Hi, everyone. Hi, Deidre. How are you um, doing? Good. How are you? Good. And I think you have, I think it's, it's we have some rare guests, but not yeah, first timers. I've, yeah, because I I've recognize called you. in when I've been um, on the North Coast because I was in the same time zone, but I live in Switzerland. Ah, that's right. Okay. Um, so, yeah, usually can't join, but I listen every week and just love the show. And I love the open mic. And I feel like, you know, I know all of you because I hear you, a lot of you who regulars every week. So, yeah, I'm glad to have the opportunity to join live. Yeah, well, we're really glad to have you. It is a nice thing about having shows at different times and different people can join. Um, yeah. So so what do you have? What was your uh, cryptid? So um, I had, I, this is the first time I've ever written a villanelle. So I've written about a legendary creature um, called the Dahu um, that is, um, uh, it's a legend in the French speaking part of Switzerland in the mountains here and also in um, the mountainous regions of France and some parts of Italy. And um, the creature is uh, like a mountain goat, but it has two short legs and two long legs. Mm -hmm. So it's adapted for the very steep mountain slopes. Interesting. <laughs> now, the problem with the dahu is that it can only go in one direction because, <laughs> <laughs> because of its anatomy. Oh, that's um, great. And um, it's basically used uh, to trick tourists. So the locals will trick the tourists by telling them about this creature. Um, and the tourists usually fall for it. I have to say, when I first moved here, I fell for it as well. <laughs> um, so um, the, the legend goes that the only way to catch it is to surprise it so that it turns around and it falls down the hill. <laughs> That's so <laughs> it's so funny with these um you know th there's so much in common with the stories you know the snipe hunt is built in there in a Swedish legend too you know so it's it's really fascinating. Yeah, so I thought the villanelle um, really lent itself to the circularity of mm -hmm. this creature, um, but yeah, it's it's really um, the ink is still drying. So here we go. It's called Life Advice from a Dao. Wherever you start is where you will end. No need to ask if you're on the right path. Go forward and onward around the bend. When under attack, don't try to descend. Don't turn around or express your wrath. Wherever you start is where you will end. A mate you will meet or surely a friend if you just watch out for your opposite half. Go forward and onward around the bend. Imagine a life where knees need not bend, where headbutts are fun, or lead to war paths. Wherever you start is where you will end. If jokes are made, don't let them offend. Join them and giggle, toss your head and laugh. Go forward and onward around the bend. Do not look back if you want to transcend, no matter the length of the legs you have. Wherever you start is where you will end. Go forward and onward around the bend. Uh, that's great, thanks so much. That was um, Deidre, um... Demonescu? Demonescu? Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. You know, I was thinking as you were reading it, um, how great it would be to share these with, because um, so many of are local legends in poem form, and it's it's formal poetry. It'd be great to share these with local newspapers, you know? I think you get these published pretty easily, um, because it'd just be fun, a fun addition to any newspaper and having the local tie-in. I think people should try to do that, just a little suggestion, but thanks for sharing that. That's great. Sure. And it was life advice from a Dahu. <laughs> Excellent there. Um, let's go next to uh, Angela Gartner. Hi, Tim. Hey, How Angela. are you? Yeah, I'm great. How are you? Good. Hey, question. Yeah. Um, 
I, you know, I try to make the poetry spaces. You guys are doing a good job with that. Uh-huh. I, but I missed last week. So how can I listen again? Like, is there a way to re-listen or, you know, listen to yeah, that? Yeah, it's actually, spaces? it's a podcast. Glad you asked because I never remember to say it. But there's a, it's a podcast on Spotify. And so you can just, and, and so you can type um, in Spotify or iTunes or anything, just type in the poetry space. And it'll come up or just say, hey, Alexa, turn on the poetry space. <laughs> and it'll come up actually there. <laughs> so uh, for some reason, it likes um, that even better than the Rattlecast. So Rattlecast I've tested, and sometimes it doesn't get the right one first. But uh, that the poetry space always does in my experience. So, yeah, anywhere you look for the poetry space, if you need a link, um, um, Katie's website is the nftpoetrygallery.com. And there's a okay. link up at the top to, um, um, to that and um and then you can find it that way too but um but it, whatever if you just search for it in any kind of uh podcast catcher because it is the problem with twitter is or x i guess now as we call it it's a really nice <laughs> nice platform for this i love the roundtable discussion it's just really fun to have a sort of free-flowing conversation about something um, you don't get to have you know there's not a lot of poets you're sitting around or at least i'm not talking to so it's nice but um but, but the problem is you have to have the twitter app and not a lot of people have twitter to, to listen and participate but you can always do the podcast version so, so thanks for saying that angela it's a good uh, good reminder yeah I'm, I'm enjoying all the episodes so far and i'm like oh i missed the money one <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wanted- it, was, it was interesting it was definitely interesting and of course dick westheimer was there who we'll talk to in a minute and uh, some others too um so anyway what do you want to share uh, with us today well, I it's it's funny because I am a newer teacher because I I'm I'm teaching um, college um, at uh, a local university here in Cleveland and you know I it's been only like really you know maybe three semesters so I still feel kind of new uh, mm-hmm. teaching and uh, last semester I had something funny happen to me <laughs> so I want to and it, when you're teaching. Um, definitely as a newer teacher you still feel I still feel a little nervous like you know as being an editor of a local magazine I still kind of feel introverted like I I just want to be in my little box and like you know typing away and I have to get up in front of people and talk so um so I still get a little nervous so I'm just but I just had like a funny experience that I thought I would write about it just to remind me like hey you know it will be fine this year will be fine so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well that reminds me I um I had the same experience. I um, Ilya Kaminsky years ago asked me to come in and teach a guest in his class, you know, and I was like going to San Diego anyway for something. I can't remember the details, but anyway, I was like, oh, I know poetry really well. I'll go teach a lesson. And it's so different to stand up in front of a class, like all those little eyeballs staring at you, you know, like like you're going to impart wisdom on them. And there's just this like, I've, it's one of two times in my life I've like froze. The other time was the first time on live radio where I was like, oh, just talking to the host and then the live on air button. And I imagined all of the, um, you know, the, my voice and all the little cars in Los Angeles all at once. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I had the same experience of teaching a class for the first time. It was um, it was it was a lot more than I realized it, it, it was. Yeah. And it's definitely at first, you know, I felt you know, as I go through the weeks and it's almost like we become a, like a little community though. It's, it's kind of nice. It's just mm-hmm. that first couple of weeks, you know, we're all trying to navigate the class and yeah, I feel you about the, the light because <laughs> I was on TV and it, it, it is, it's true. There's the, the, it's hot in there first of all, in the studio and then the light comes on and deer in headlights for me. <laughs> it so. Really? It, it is. There's something about that. They should not have a light <laughs> that tells you, or at least they should put it behind the guest or something. Um, but anyway, um, so, so yeah, let's hear this poem first. It's a short one and you sent two. So I think you could share the other one too, but let's do that. And the new teacher is missing first. Okay. The new teacher is missing. The morning sounds of birds cooing reminds me that my alarm will soon start ringing. Anxiety is starting to kick in. A matter of hours, I will see 24 youthful faces at computers. I remember last time the first week happened. I mistook the floor for a chair on wheels. Down I went, the room gas, and I disappeared behind my desk. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely the feeling I had. <laughs> it was a good, <laughs> a good, uh, a good uh, reflection of that experience. And um, and then you have the other one too. So I wasn't af- uh, she wasn't afraid to write the poem. What what's this? Yeah, this was actually like a couple um, 
a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a Ukrainian uh, poet and writer. Um, she was killed in a missile strike. Um, and if you like read her Twitter, um, and I kind of just came across it, but she was kind of afraid of this happening. And it was just crazy. She she kind of stopped writing. Um, she actually stopped writing um, like her work to kind of write about what was going on um, with the war. Um, it's Victoria uh, Melina. Mm -hmm. I might be saying that wrong, but uh, a Ukrainian novelist and poet. And, you know, I just was, you know, I... I I never read her work until I heard about what happened to her, but, you know, it's just another, you know, someone um, in Ukraine who was trying to do good and who was killed. So um, I wrote this story about, you know, I wrote this poem about her. Hmm. Okay, go ahead, whenever I've got it up. She wasn't afraid to write the poem. I drive by rows of neatly stacked bricks, silently sitting on fertilized grass. The front windows are un the the front windows are undisturbed. I'm free to roam in the dark. I'm hungry for a scone and a hot coffee. Cafe's line is filled with chattering people who worry about the week's weather. Will the clouds bring a summer thunderstorm? A leftover firecracker goes off in the parking lot. Everyone scrambles for cover, but laughs because they aren't the target. The girl in the cafe miles away were the broken pieces of stone. It litters a road from the rocket's blast. The dust chokes them as black smoke rises. Their ashes fall. There's blood on the walls from fists pounding in despair to end a war. She wrote about a warning, but hoped it wouldn't be a poem about her. No, oh, that's tragic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's such a sad story and, um, you know, worthy of being commemorated in a poem. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. Yeah. I suggest everyone to look her up if they have a minute, like, mm -hmm. you know, and look at her Twitter. She was really trying to bring the literary community up and, and, and going. And mm -hmm. it's just kind of a tragedy. We lose another a poet. So yeah. what was her name again? Um, It's Victoria Amelina. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I can spell it. But yeah, um it's it's A M E L I N A, Victoria um, Amelina. I'm mm -hmm. probably saying that wrong, but yeah. um mm -hmm. But well, yeah, I suggest everyone look her up. She's uh definitely was an inspiration over there. So Yeah, well I definitely will. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. All right, well you guys have a great day. Yep. Thanks. You too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. It's Angela Gartner with uh two poems. She had the um um, the new teacher is missing, and she wasn't afraid to write the poem. Let's go next to Dick Westheimer. Hey, hey Tim. Hey, Dick. How are you doing today? Good. Uh, I just noticed I've been unmuted all this time. <laughs> yeah, but you are, I noticed that too, but you've been completely silent. It's never mattered. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize. Uh, no I problem. Could, could have made a sound that, that Zoom wouldn't have muted out. Um, wow. Wow. I, I just the, the interview and you probably saw in the chat comments people were just enchanted by it yeah well and i then, really enjoyed uh, it myself i mean it was it was uh she's great and in a lot of levels um you know both poetically and interesting perspective yeah absolutely and uh yeah i just emptied my pocket of an, enough money to buy a paperback book so. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and i loved your villanelle it was so it i I tried to sort of find this sense of discovery of me and my villanelle, mm -hmm. but it, which I think you did really well, um, but it didn't work as well for me, but I tried. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that was, I was uh, moving through. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I was moving through kind of thing like, oh, it's going to go anywhere. And then I found a way to make it go somewhere. So I was happy with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, it did what, uh, well, anyway. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could have written a poem about a villanelle being a cryptid. It's a monster. <laughs> it's, it is uh, it is a monster itself. But instead, I wrote uh, one about a golem, and I, I sent it through Submittable Portal. Is that the way you want these? Um, yeah, yeah. Either way is fine. So we can I can pull that up. Although um, prompt poems, right? Yeah, here it is. The um, Friedel the golem, right? Yeah. Fredel, the golem, and mm -hmm. the brief history of the dissident Jew. So for those who don't know, a golem is a, sort of a mythic 
mythic um, legendary a creature made of mud and animated by some combination of Hebrew letters and chants that are put in its mouth and commonly um, brought to life to protect an imperiled uh, Jewish community. Hmm. Um, yeah. So uh, often it's depicted as one that is um, uh, sometimes uh, control of it is lost by its master and it causes all sorts of havoc, but not this one. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Uh, Fredel, the Golem, and the br a Brief History of a Dissident Jew. Only make a golem when you need to repulse the rabid, torch-lit horde. Even then, your safety is not guaranteed. Just ask the girl who taught herself to read Torah, Talmud, the history of the court, and how to make a golem when she needs. She ignored when the governor decreed, put girls who study Torah to the sword. He raged, your safety is not guaranteed. The girl takes a parchment and proceeds to thrust it in the mud man's mouth, transforms it into the golem that she needs. The monster plods through the mob and heaves a boulder from there into the sea and roars to the rabble that their safety is not guaranteed. Now Friedel no longer is besieged. A woman now, she tells her baby girl, only make a golem when you need. Even then, your safety is not guaranteed. Yeah, that was excellent. I love the sounds too. The villanelle is actually, you know, a, a favorite form. I think when other people are writing it, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a little tricky. But, there you uh, go. but when I'm he when you hear people read a villanelle, it, there's the rhymes come out so strongly, and it's such a, a musical form. And you know, with the, both the repetition and the rhyme, that combination I think works really well. Yeah, it, may, it, made me, it made me wonder. You know, like when you know one art or uh, you know the other great villanelles, whether the poet started off writing a villanelle or they started off with a first line mm -hmm. and then a villanelle made it asserted itself on them yeah um, i wonder I, I would love to ask elizabeth bishop that it's funny that that was you know that came up so much in jane clark's discussion and her history of poetry when you know we had the villanelle today but yeah i do wonder if if you know did she set out to write one art as a villanelle or, or did it you know was it some draft eventually it became that way and uh, mm -hmm. Katie is holding up a book I see at the corner of my eye that's one art. <laughs> yeah. It's very thick. I, I'm very not sure. Thick. Katie, why don't you pop on and tell me what you're doing? Because I don't understand. I was just, I was pointing out there's a lot to say about that poem. Oh, that, uh, so it's a book, that's a whole book about the poem. It's actually Elizabeth art. Bishop's letters, and I have not, I'm only like just started it, but mm -hmm. talking about it. But that's, I'm really interested because that's my favorite Villanelle probably too, is one art. And I feel like with her, she had to have thought like I, I can show the loss best by repeating these lines throughout. I feel like she knew, mm -hmm. but yeah. I'll get back to you in <laughs> three you, years when I'm reading this book. <laughs> that, is, that is the book that includes her, one of my favorite quotes about poetry is that it's, um, that all art is a self-forgetful, perfectly useless concentration. Um, yeah. I love that, that aspect of it. And it comes from, yeah. it's one of those letters where she wrote it to, um, I think she was writing to, I can't remember who, but she was writing to another poet and that's what she said. Well, what what occurs to me is for that to happen, you have to have, you, you know, you talk about poetry as a practice, but you have to have practiced the form before it would be one that would then assert itself on you mm. as the necessary form for a particular line yeah, that started. I think that, that definitely that must be the case. I, I agree. Maybe maybe it's just like learning to play a different type of music, like, you know, learning to play jazz when you're a classical pianist or something, and then you can hear, hey, this would be better for that. I, yeah. I have heard the music of a villanelle. I will feel that I have mastered the form if I ever start writing, like, well, this is going to be a villanelle, but stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Kate. Prompt, I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks, Dick. It's great, great to be able to share that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was Dick Westheimer with um, Friedel the Gollum, um, and a brief history of an errant Jew, another excellent villanelle. Let's go next to uh, Stephen Croft. Hey, Tim. Hey, Steve. Uh, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. So, um, um, yeah, what do you have for us today? Well, like 
Katie, I've, I've also thought of a song title. It's a takeoff on the Rolling Stones, um, their sympathy for the devil, which I thought of as its, its first person. And so I wrote sympathy for the Sasquatch. <laughs> that's great. I love that title. Sympathy for the Sasquatch. I guess that shows too that alliteration adds something weird. You're just having the sympathy for the Sasquatch. Right. Makes it a right. lot of fun. I had to go with Sasquatch <laughs> and not Bigfoot, obviously. Yeah, exactly. But um, I did go back and uh, look at the uh, In Search of Bigfoot with Leonard Nimoy um, on YouTube which uh, was the reason I was interested in Bigfoot when I was young and was devoted to reading about him in elementary school, and I made myself an expert. So uh, I enjoyed writing this. Interesting. This is Sympathy for the Sasquatch. I know you've heard all the rumors, how moonlight fell on an ape-like beast. Leave my howling anger to assumers. Hunchback sculptured in chainsaw contours. They do not know me in the least. I know you've heard all the rumors. Don't fall in with B-movie horror consumers. Forever shy, but if you please, not a beast. Leave my howling anger to assumers. I'm a nature boy, a midnight crooner. Genera homo's hippie, hair matted and greased. If I throw a boulder, it's just deep woods humor. If you come in peace, you'll see me sooner. My line is old, but not deceased. Leave my howling anger to assumers. Hairy monster, a first sight misnomer. If I come off wrong, I've made my case at least. I know you've heard all the rumors. Leave my howling anger to assumers. Oh, that's great. I love that if I throw a boulder, it's just deep woods humor. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, he should, yeah, uh, the well, Sasquatch that... should go talk to Nivedita's uh, Yeti, too. <laughs> right. They they were a little bad about throwing boulders, you know, if you, um, in fact, that's how the, ins uh, that's how the In Search Of started. Mm -hmm. They attacked some miners in what's now called Ape Canyon there. Mount St. Helens. Do you, do you think there's any uh, any possibility that, it, that you know that it is deep woods out there and um, right? You know, it kind of hominid yeah. is is secretly around, and that you know the there are two things that make me think it's possible is that uh, mm -hmm. um, what's her name? I keep saying Jane Kenyon. Jane, you know, the one who who lived with the the gorillas. Jane. Um, Good all. Good all. She she said that she thinks it's possible in an interview once. I saw the clip. And so um, that made me like, wait, wait, if <laughs> she thinks it's possible, maybe it well, is. And then uh, and also there were the the um, I can't remember the name of it, but the, the pygmy hominid was discovered to live be living only like 3000 years ago um, on an mm -hmm. island. I think maybe um, off the coast of Africa, if I remember right. I can't remember exactly. But but there's a skeleton that wasn't that old and um, mm -hmm. of this completely different uh, hominid. So maybe, you know. Well, they keep creeping the Neanderthals up closer and closer to uh, contemporary times. And, you know, for a while there was the debate over whether we had interbred with the Neanderthal. But with the DNA, um, it's now a fact that we did. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, I was reading just recently, just this month, they announced they found a new a new hominid in China that predates both Neanderthal and Homo sapien. Uh, they've only got the skull, but, um, you know, with drones and, and helicopters and, um, it seems like we would have found them by now, but I like to think they're out there. Yeah. Still, or, or find a, a, just, a, a just body, very, you know, very or, shy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very shy. It is. It is fun to think about, though. And uh, to stay tuned for my psyku, which happens to be a related subject. So, <laughs> okay. Um, right. Anyway, let's. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Stephen. It was a wonderful poem. Another great villanelle. Sympathy for the Sasquatch. I appreciate it. Thank you. Stephen Croft with a uh, sympathy for a Sasquatch. And next, we will go to Carla Schwartz. Hi. I'm so glad to be here. I didn't realize it was early and i'll be coming back <laughs> yeah all right yeah it was a great episode so definitely do go back um but yeah I since will... jane's in ireland we had to move it up uh to, a, to an earlier slot so she could get it um so what do you have for us uh, carla so um i have a, a villanelle about champ the um 
Lake Serpent of Lake Champlain. Ah, that, that's one I'm familiar with because I, you know, it's not too far from from Western New York. Rochester. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So this is called, and I don't know if people know the word glamping, glamp. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of glamorous <laughs> camping, if you like. Uh -huh. So this is called Glamping with Champ. Oh, that's great. I love that. <laughs> we embark Champlain. We set out to glamp in our fancy electric tiny houseboat. We vie for survival against yachts, winds, and champ. Nine windows with screens in our houseboat camp. Toaster oven, microwave, induction plate, and pan to fry our eggs each champlain morning we set out to glamp while our boat on anchor our towels damp we tuck safely in coves after swims underway we try to survive against yachts strong winds and champ and sorry and champ the lake's mythical serpent, not known to romp, rather to swim, to lake's surface, to send boats awry as they embark Champlain, set out to glamp on anchor or transient slip, these fancified tramps, not like us, of course, in our one-of-a-kind house, to survive against winds, other yachts, and champ. We lived by forecast to travel the lake, revamped our plans when forced back by storms or swirls of algae on our Champlain Traverse when we set out to glamp, but met yachts, followed winds, surfed humps of champ. Oh, that's another great one. I love. I just love all the the cryptids, um, the the Loch Ness monster one. I read a novel um, that was based on this theory, which is that um, it's actually an eel. Have you ever heard that one? That there's a deep water eel that can grow very mm -hmm. large in big lakes, and so that occasionally they come to the surface, and that's what the Loch Ness monster actually is. And in this novel, all the townsfolk knew about knew that, but every time they sort of discovered it, they had to hide it for the tourists income basically um but it's just interesting i mean it's another one though that you know there could be some creature that we don't quite know you know they're, they're always discovering new species all the time a big one would be rare and surprising but it's possible they thought the tasmanian tiger was extinct who knows maybe at the bottom of uh, certain lakes we've got something yeah thanks for have you seen anything weird out on your boats um carla not uh animal wise mm -hmm. um We've definitely seen some weird people. Yeah. <laughs> well, people are animals, and they're definitely That's weird. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yeah. No aliens yeah, had... either, right? No UFOs. or There's a word for underwater well, UFOs, too. I can't remember what they call them, but uh, nothing like that. We had a teenager. Uh -huh. Now, these are weird, right? A, yeah. a, like a 16-year-old boy knock on our door after 11 p.m. the oh, other wow. night. That was scary, oh, wow. I can tell you. <laughs> that would be, yeah. Well, well thanks for your, sharing your uh, Glamping with Camp, a really fun poem. These are all a little fun villanelles. Thanks, Carla. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. And then the, that was Carla Schwartz again with Glamping with Champ. And um, let's see. And the last poet we have in the line is uh, Bishwajit Mishra. Hi, Tim. Hey, Bishop, how are you doing today? I don't have your camera on. I don't know if you want to turn it on. But... Yeah, no, I want to turn it on. <laughs> there you go. Okay, great yeah. to see you. Uh, thank you. I was on a road trip for 10 days, camping out uh, up north, up to Yukon, oh, Dawson that's City. that's great. Yeah. Yeah, so I just got back last night. So I couldn't do the the prompt poem of last week, mm -hmm. Villanelle. Uh, because of the forum, it's it's something, uh, it's very complicated for me, but I'm going to do it later. Okay, well, great. I'm looking uh, forward to Because it, it needs out. time, and I could not do it from there. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't have very spotty connections. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I may, um, if you have time, I can read the um, prompt point from last week's that I had sent. Yeah, is that the one you sent? Is it the uh, Passage Through Black Hole? That's the one I wrote in Yukon that I would like to read if there is time. Yeah, definitely. But whatever you choose to. No, yeah, please choose. do. Uh, uh, the, did you send two? And this one was uh, through uh, 
submittable ah. sun earth and Okay, let me pull that up then. Uh, They're both short points. Like yeah, yeah, they definitely points. are. <laughs> let me just pull up this one then first. Oops. Man, got a lot of windows open. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So this is Sun, Earth, and? Yeah. So I have the original poem by Hafiz, uh -huh. uh, the Persian Sufi poet on the second page, because if somebody had not read, read that, it might be helpful. So, uh, and this is a poem, uh, uh, it's, it, it's that prompt about making a suggestion. Why a don't suggestion you read the, the Hafiz poem first, so then we can... Uh, okay, yeah. the sun never says, even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me, look, what happens with a love like that? It lights the whole sky. Oh, yeah. That's a beautiful poem. I'd forgotten about beautiful. that one. But, but so, yeah, yeah, so famous, too. I'm sure most are familiar with it. But, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. It just, I don't know, for some reason it touched me every day. I read it after a long time mm -hmm. again. So I had it copied and thought if I get a chance, I will write during my trip. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, and that's what I did from Yukon uh, River, uh, White House by Yukon River. The sun, earth, and wondering about Hafiz's poem, The Sun Never Says. Master Hafiz, I can't question you, but that doesn't stop me from wondering. Could you not have given the sky a more active or say less passive role? When you said about the love of sun for the earth, it lights the whole sky. Unless you meant that's how love is held in between. Oh, they had very beautiful reaction, sun, earth, and <laughs> to that uh, beautiful Havis poem. So thanks so much for sharing that, Bishwajit. Uh, no problem. Thank you. And then Appreciate the, that. Yeah. And then the other one, um, yeah, I definitely read the other one too, the black hole. And it includes some pictures too. So we'll, I'll put those yeah, up. So. so yeah. Either way, if you want to go and show the pictures. So what happened? It was in the city of Whitehorse. Mm -hmm. I visited. And I was. I drove everywhere, and so there was. Uh, I camp alone and go and drive. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I drove to this place. I saw these totem poles, and I love totems. Mm -hmm. And it has got a story. And there's a plaque uh, underneath this. So th this is about the residential school systems. There's reconciliation going on. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's what they did. And there's a story. If you get a chance and read this, uh, the description, they've saved the images, what they are. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful story. Uh, I, I can read only one part that may be relevant for the poem. This mm -hmm. is the poem symbolizes... Uh, the reunion of separated lives. It, it's on the plaque there, uh, this part, uh, mm -hmm. if you can see. Yeah. Um, and uh, the mother, father, and the bear, uh, and uh, crow, they're, they're different uh, tribes, uh, different clans, the crow and uh, the bear. And uh, it's so uh, this is the picture, this is depicted in that um, thing. And the last part where it says the boot chips were burned. Mm hmm. Uh, and placed inside the mother's womb or something like that. That is the line that just, I said, yeah, uh, I don't know if I can, something touched in the, by, in the night by the tent. Yeah. And uh, my campsite was by Yukon River, and you can hear it flowing all night. Mm -hmm. And that sound I love, it doesn't disturb me. It's just, oh, definitely uh, beautiful. I have a yeah. problem that falls yeah. with you. Oh, that's the water flowing. So a passage through black hole. The mother carries the load of the children who looked as children do looking out of a trip bus. The father went out looking, but until the gate of the garden of our kids, where birds lose their songs, the crow turns to a cuckoo to music classes. Majesty is the price paid. Its cause still echoing after it. The bear, as always, stopped at the fence of the apple orchard, returning outsmoked, melts in hibernation, and all the mother carries. With the flames, the ashes too. Her room is a repository of the beginning and the end. Who knows 
what comes out of the black hole. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, great poem, a Poet Respond type poem there um, uh, in a different you. way. But yeah, uh, from the Robert Service Campground in White Horse. After visiting a totem pole <laughs> to remember the children lost in the residential schools. Yeah, beautiful poem and, and great story. Thanks for sharing that, Bishop. Uh, thank you. And the, uh, one more thing I wanted to add is that the, there was a picture. It's not here. I thought it was there. And uh, they were showing the kids in the school bus from, I don't know, maybe uh-huh. 30s or 40s. And there is somebody, a priest or somebody, a teacher, was holding a toddler oh, wow. mm-hmm. on the ground. Yeah. And these kids are looking out of the window as if they're on a school trip or something. It mm-hmm. just, they didn't know probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, it's a toddler. Yeah. And they could take that. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Bishop. Always a pleasure. Oh, I love thank that. you. And, and glad you got out to go, go camping and spend some time in, in nature too this week. Yeah, I'm just getting to the ground. And luckily, I caught this episode. I would have missed it. I'm going to watch again because as a villain else, mm-hmm. I have to watch again. Yeah, there's yeah. Well, a lot of good examples. That, that, that's interesting Oh, yeah, they're form. so good. Yeah. And excellent. by the way, they, I I was thinking about two topics that I was going to write if I was going to write. One was Yeti. The other was Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, yeah. They're taking time to come up some. It's something else. I think I think the Florida one is the swamp ape. So maybe you could do the swamp apes. We cover all the geographical uh, versions of that. All right. Okay, well, yeah. thanks so much, Bishwajit. It's always great talking Thank to you. Thank you. Yep. Take yeah. care. And Bishwajit Mishra with uh, two poems there. And, oh, Sarah Horn is here on the Zoom too. So let's uh, let's get Sarah as well. Uh, late jumping on. Hey, Sarah, are you there? Hi, oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> yeah, great to see you. So, so glad you could be here. Um, your camera's not on. If you want to turn it on, but you don't have to. There we go. Hello. I think that's... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> yeah, great to see you. So, uh, so what do you have for us today? Okay, so I thought I'd do um, a fun villanelle about the beast of Bodmin Moor, which is supposed to be a black sort of panther-like cat that lurks around on um, a moor in Cornwall. So, <laughs> okay, let me try to uh, pull it up. Where did you send that? Was um, I sent that it? online? Yeah. Okay, let me pull it up. <laughs> yeah, here we go. She's the beast of Bodmin Moor. Very fascinating. And so, how did how long have you known about this cryptid? Is it something that you? Um, discovered recently in the in the process of doing this or is it something you've known about for a while it's something i've sort of known about for a while yeah so mm-hmm. it just it was one of the first things that came to me just for a bit of fun so yeah. and, and where are you calling from too I, I should say um i'm in the uk i'm down near salisbury so uh-huh. excellent okay cool well let's hear this the, the she's the beast <laughs> <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so i've got white yellow eyes stealthy black paw she pads over wind scrap Windswept crags at dusk, she's the beast of Bob Moor. A mournful cry atop a tour turns any wanderer to a husk. White yellow eyes, stealthy black paw. Is she looking for a mate or claw? Rippling fur, soft shadowed puss, she's the beast of Bob Moor. Dark whispers of her in folklore, by firelight, arabesque sparks and gusts. White yellow eyes, stealthy black paw. Black as obsidian, panthera roar. The ghost of the forest, she weaves and ionks. She's the beast of Bobmin Moor. She's not a monster, just a playful outlaw, crunching sheep bones with fang or tusk. White yellow eyes, stealthy black paw. She's the beast of Bobmin Moor. <laughs> uh, very interesting. And it's interesting too that the um, you know the UK has such so many big cat legends, which is <laughs> yeah. curious. I, I wonder. I always wonder why you know why cats. You know, mm. like it's the one place that has the big cats instead of like. <laughs> the big dogs or the big, uh, you know, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, very interesting. I lo- love the villain. Thanks so much for sharing that. That's, oh, thank that... you, Tim. <laughs> you take care. Yep, you too. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, that was Sarah Horn with uh, She's the Beast of Bodmin Moor. Um, excellent villanelle. And now let's see, is there anybody else who sent a villanelle I might read? Um, let's see. Um... Lucy Chow has one. Um, it's uh, Toby the Learned P- Learned Pig, and um, Lucy's not here. I guess it's a different, much different time in uh, China than normal. I think it's, normally it's the it's probably um, yeah, it must be like two a.m. or something in China. So we'll read Lucy's poem for her. Um, here we go, and this is Toby the Learned Pig. 
And so I dropped out the, uh, let me let me redo the, the uh, stanza breaks for you. So it looks like a villanelle. Okay. This is uh, Toby the Learned Pig uh, by Lucy Chow. Here we go. There we go. And there we go. Okay. Toby the Learned Pig. Discourse on the feudal system, the rights of kings, spell the saints' names, tell the time by taps of feet, prove by example, animals are not machines. Disarm the aggressive narcissism of human beings by flaunting your charisma, docility, and wit. Discourse on the feudal system, the rights of kings. If a lady thinks you a figment of her imaginings, read her mind for her, she'll give you a big treat and suspect that animals are not mere machines. Take your proud seat among other marvelous things, parliament of monsters, appearance of the paraclete, banter mistress of feudal lords, paramours of kings. Be a showmaster, puller of your own puppet strings, unravel the cruel cat's cradle of our crass conceit that animals are nothing but mere dumb machines. Tour with a circus, climb the great chain of being, complete and win, compete and win championships as a cerebral athlete. Discourse on the feudal system, the rights of kings, prove by example, animals are no mere machines. Excellent, Villanelle. Thanks so much for sharing that, Lucy. Uh, that was great. I, you know, as always, the, the wordplay going on in uh, Lucy's poems is outstanding. Um, let me see. There was someone else who sent one in, too. Probably can't be here right at this time. Um, yeah, and that was uh, Ted Guevara has a villanelle for us. And as always, Ted includes a picture. And look at the beautiful... This is a bird. This bird is so beautiful that I'm wondering if it's AI. I don't know. Um, you can see it on the screen. Um, it's a kind of like red, peacockish, with like a huge kind of uh, <laughs> Trump... <laughs> Trumpian orange haircut. I don't know, a very interesting bird running across the snow here. I'm skeptical that this actually exists, but it probably does. Um, that's the poem he included, the picture he included. And here is uh, his villanelle. Um, Giving in has but feathers. Crave rebirth always involves tender moving. You must partake in what you know is fantastic. There's hardly self-doubt in all that improving. A mirror out in the rain, dripping and drastic, reflects your once attempt at love. And at reeling, all is a blur, but you're elastic. You look up, see curves of sterling thereof. Being born afresh means austerity would be tested. You tread past wet, you tread past wet the sinking you must be free of. For the phoenix you see in the sky isn't created. All is majestic fire, a mean of blue amidst the eyes, yet sharp it jets up from the mirror uncontested. There is no window for tossing misfortune dice, misfortunate dice. Spark must be found before decay. Re-entering should be waste any used disguise. For you are winged to soar that bow of plight. You have the broom to garner the embers of day. It is us to be born in the fulfillment of bright. It is us to be born in the tenderness of night. Great last lines there. And then I love the line, um, um, where was it? The one, all is a blur, but you are elastic. I like that one. The great line said, thanks for sharing that. It was Ted Bernal Guevara with another villanelle about a cryptid. Um, now we're going to say, let's see. So that's the it for the uh, poems for today. Let's, um, before the psyche, I've never, I haven't really decided whether I should do the, the prompt for next week before the psyche or after the psyche now. It's a little different. Let's do it before the psyche. Uh, we'll see how that feels. Um, and uh, the prompt for next week, Katie's prompt that we did based on um, looking at uh, Jane's book um, and thinking about that, the prompt for this week was to. Um, pick a single word at random from the dictionary and use that as the title of a poem in which someone gets their hands dirty. So it's a long, complicated sentence, but pick a, word, a single word at random from the dictionary and use that as the title of a poem in which someone gets their hands dirty. So um, something's going to happen in that poem. And it's going to have a single word title, and, uh, and that's going to be your spark of, um, of interest in the prompt. So please go ahead and do that. 
Now, uh, let's do the side coup at this point. And the side coup this week, I alluded to it before. It was based on this article. Um, let me pull that up. Um, it's loading slowly. I had a weird link that has to be redirected. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay, so here it is. Um, New research suggests a key role of ice age cycles in early human interbreeding. This is from Passan National University. And um, what, the, what they did in this study is they, they looked at um, um, what was going on. And you can't really read it. I, I really don't like the way that they do websites anymore. They're just not browser friendly. Um, they just have to write, make some for phones. Um, but here's a nice graphic to show. They, they looked and modeled and looked at the genes of um, the Denisovians and Neanderthals, talking about when they interbred. Because we, as uh, Stephen Croft talked about earlier in the episode, there was interbreeding between Neanderthals and Homo sapiens and Denisovians, which is another hominid. And what they found is that there are these windows of interaction because the, um, I think it was the Denisovian, Denisovans lived um, more in uh, Asia and the um, Neanderthals were more in Europe. And so when the climate permitted in these um, warmer times, when there was less ice, there was a lot of transport and overlap in their territories. And you could see that in the DNA evidence that we were having more interaction, more interbreeding between Denisovians and Neanderthals. And so the climate played a big role in that, that uh, um, evolution of uh, hominids. And so interesting thing to think about, um, to be able to look back through time over 400,000 years and see that these little windows where there was interbreeding going on. And uh, so the haiku that was inspired by that is right here. Whether or not a seesaw. Whether or not a seesaw. And if you're only listening, weather is spelled like the, you know, the weather outside and not is with a K. Whether or not a seesaw. That is your Saiku for this week. That is the show for this week. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Been a really wonderful one. Jane was just a great guest. I love both her poetry and the discussion. Great open lines, villanelles. Um, Be sure to send in your villanelles um, to the prompt poems category on Submittable. Go to rattle.com, submissions. You'll find the Rattlecast prompt poems. Um, This this last prompt, um, the one we're doing for next week, Uh, which, again, is to pick a single word at random from the dictionary and use that as the title of a poem in which someone gets their hands dirty. Um, That's going to be the last one that you can submit for August prompt poem of the month. We're going to pick the best poem, or Katie's going to pick the best poem um, every month and um, publish that on rattle.com as part of our regular poetry of the day feature that we do through email and all that stuff on the front page of our website. Um, One prompt poem every week from, or every month from this series. Um, so do submit yours and submit your uh, submit yours next week. Submit anything you want um, that's been one of these four prompts for August. Submit it by August 31st, and then it might be the prompt poem of the month in September. So that's a lot of fun, a little bonus that we're doing now. Now, next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be um, Pedro Poitevin. And Pedro's a fascinating person. Um, he's a mathematician and a formalist poet, one of the smartest people I've ever met in the poetry world. Uh, he has a new book out, Nowhere at Home. I believe it's his first book of poetry in English. Um, I think he's, he's published others in Spanish, if I remember right. Um, but uh, Nowhere at Home is it's just a beautiful book um, full of all sorts of different forms of poetry. So we'll be talking about a whole bunch of that. I'm sure he has some villanelles in there. I haven't looked at it yet, but I'm sure he does. He's got a whole bunch of stuff and a lot of play with you know syllabics and numbers and all sorts of things he's a very smart interesting person really looking forward to how he sees poetry as a mathematician that's gonna be next week's guest for rattlecast 208 uh, your prompt of course is to pick a word and uh, make that the title for a poem in which your hands get dirty that'll all be next week back at the regular time 8 p.m eastern 5 p.m pacific monday august 28th so hope to see you then hope you have a great week in the meantime and i'll talk to you later goodbye